um, cloud our thinking so that our conclusions are skewed by that what it is that we have residing in, residing in our hearts. And this is why is that the question really is, is that can a human being really be objective? This whole idea that there is objective knowledge and it is the sole property of Western man, especially in a university setting, is completely ridiculous. Is that human beings cannot be objective. There is no that complete objectivity when it comes to human beings. Is that we will all have that frames that we think in. And then this gets down to the different types of frames. And that this is a topic in and of itself. But what is meant here also is that Allah will seal. And the idea of a heart being sealed is it will affect our perception. Is that it will affect how we're impacted by certain things. A person that is mutakabbar, that is prideful, is that it's going to be very hard for them to show empathy towards people that are weak. Why? Because their hearts are sealed. They are in a state of where they disregard people to begin with. Oftentimes they are contemptful or have many of the other previously mentioned traits. How could they show empathy? And if you don't have empathy, why would you care? And if you don't care, why would you do anything about it? And so that hearts being sealed are not only in terms of perception, but also in terms of things that we should do in certain circumstances. And so there's consequences, if you will, of having these traits of heart. And then we have the verse, إِنَّ Allah لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُسْتَكْبِرِينَ Indeed, that Allah Ta'ala does not love those who are prideful. And there are a number of other verses that, that deal uh, with pride and that other closely related that attributes of them. And then we have this that severe warning of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. And keep in mind, all of the warnings of the Prophet are really warnings that are embedded in doesn't want her child to get sick. And so the warnings of the Prophet, even though they're in one sense jalali, they're, ma they're majestic, in another sense, it's mercy. Because good and evil, what's right and what's wrong, was crystal clear to the Rasul. And he conveyed what it is was good and what it is was bad. What is right, what is wrong. And so him warning us really is out of mercy. Because he doesn't want us to do anything that would harm us in this world or in the next. And so he says, لَا يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةَ مَنْ كَانَ فِي قَلْبِ مِثْقَلْ حَبَّةً مِنْ خَرْدٍ مِنْ كِبَرٍ Is that no one that has a mustard grain seed of pride, of kibber in their heart, will enter into paradise. But then, in this narration that's in Muslim, he juxtaposes that with an, with, with an opposite. وَلَا يَدْخُلِ النَّارَ رَجُلٌ فِي قَلْبِ مِثْقَلْ حَبَّةٍ مِنْ خَرْدٍ مِنْ إِيمَانٍ And that no one will enter into the fire that has a mustard grain seed of faith in their heart. And so it's interesting here. Why is he juxtaposing Iman to Kibar? It's very interesting. Because that Kibar is one of the greatest things that again prevents people from seeing the signs of Allah and thus believing in them. And the worst form of kibber is to have kibber get in the way of you knowing your Lord. The second worst form of kibber, of pride, is it for it to come between you and your belief in the Messenger of Allah. If you would just, just look at how many people that, let's just look at Islam, how many people that their view of prophets in general or specifically how they view Muslims, makes it virtually impossible for them, unless they can overcome that, from ever accepting the faith. If your view of Muslims is that they're terrorists, they're inferior, right? Or if you know a little bit about Islam in the United States, why would I want to join a religion that so many black people have joined? I'm totally serious. Why would I want to join an Arab religion? These people live in a desert climate. And these ridiculous people have these notions. 
how would you ever accept a faith that that's how you view it? It comes in the way or all these things you hear about the Prophet. Now, the question of that how we deal with people who are, are afflicted with this, that's a whole other topic. Right? How we can go about that teaching people the true nature of the Prophet Muhammad. Teaching them the true nature of, is about, uh, of how Muslims are and the way they should be and the diversity of, of Muslims across. These are all, that's all other issues. But that in and of itself, even if we say, oh, that's all they're exposed to. Let's not conflate issues. We recognize wrong is wrong. Our mercy for someone in terms of their, what they've been conditioned with in their society is something else. So we have to do two things. Recognize wrong as wrong. And then how we go about dealing with that is a whole separate issue. Okay, but let's, let's put everything in its proper place. And that is not a good thing. If someone's that view of something is preventing them from really the objectively looking at what this, what's the reality of this thing that is before me. In this case, we're talking about our deen. You can see how it would prevent someone. And so it's very interesting to note this juxtaposition of iman, of, of kibbutz on one hand, pride, to iman. Because it is one of the greatest things that prevent people from believing. Is their own arrogance. Where they don't even feel like they're in need. They feel like they have everything. Some people are like this. And this is surely not the only thing. There's a long list of things. But this is one of the greatest. And so you have a number of a hadith of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that relate that to this. And that this is why that when you look at what our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about the... the a good percentage, if not the majority, of the people of paradise. Who did he describe them as? The du'afa, which are literally the weak. The suqat, right? those that are not nobles in society. That people that no one really cares about. And the ajazatuhum, and the enable. That these tend to be, if you look over human history, the vast majority of people that have responded to prophetic truth are people of these categories. Which is precisely in most societies, including our society, what the type of people that no one wants to be like. It's just really interesting if you think about that. And how should your conception be as a Muslim, wherever you are? If you're living in the United States of America, you have to recognize you're not living in a neutral society. And what I mean by that is, is that just by virtue of you stepping foot in this land, there is a history here. And that history is not just gone because you don't see some of its manifestations before your eyes anymore. We have to be more intelligent than that. That much of the negative side of our history, and there's definitely a good side too, but much of the negative side is now just taken on new forms. And we are required as being conscientious human beings, let alone believers, who are supposed to combine that um, intelligence with religiosity, and intelligence is a part of religiosity, but let's just speak of them as separate, to do what is right in any given society. And if there is imbalances in any direction, we are required to understand. We are in the United States of America. If we're living in Canada, we have to understand Canadian society. If we're living in Venezuela, we have to understand Venezuelan society. If we're living in um, Papua New Guinea, we have to understand the society in which we are living. And then do what's right in relation to that. And we can't just let the normal way that people do things dictate what it is that we do. Because you will, that unintentionally, that you will unintentionally support that oppressive um, that things without you even realizing. If you don't make the, righteous, the right decision, and go against the grain in relation to those things. And 
it becomes more difficult when that these forms of oppression become more subtle. It becomes more difficult. But this is very important that we be aware of this. But if we think about this, this is a classic example, is that we have to be people that care for all people, not just the people that society cares for. And we oftentimes, all of us, most of us, have double standards in terms of converts that we incline towards or disincline towards, in terms of people who we welcome into the community or don't welcome into the community, in terms of where we give our money to and where we don't give our money to. Most of us have double standards. And let's just at first realize that we've fallen short so we can treat that. And it takes courage to do this, to really question a way that has been ingrained into you, into you for so long. It's not necessarily evil all times. Sometimes it's just blatantly evil, but it's not always evil. And we have to have the courage to question a lot of these things and to learn to do the right thing. And some of these conversations are very uncomfortable. But if we're going to be successful in terms of what is to me the most important thing that we need to be doing in these lands in the upcoming decades and over the next 100 to 200 years, we have to get this right. If we get this wrong, is that our religion will have a shelf life in the United States of America. If we get it right, that we can position ourselves to have that in, in a very powerful, positive impact upon society. And this is the way that we should be thinking. We want to be contributing to society that based upon our own unique that conception of what is right and what is wrong. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. On the contrary, this is what this society in which we live is supposed to be in principle about and oftentimes fall short. But we have to have principle and engagement at every single levels where we make unique contributions based upon the beauty of our deen. And that we should, that unabashedly contribute based upon our own principles. And if anyone tries to set up uh, a, a, a frame that doesn't allow for that, you speak to them in their own language. Nothing is more un-American than that. I'm not talking about the, the way that we would necessarily conceive. I'm talking about the way that it's conceived of in this country. Nothing is more un-American than that. And so that this whole idea that you have to just uphold the status quo and to not make a fuss about certain things, that's not being a true American. What I understand a true American to be, in one of the many manifestations, of the, if you believe in something, you stand by that thing, and if you have to go against something, you go against it based upon your principles. And people's principles are defined by different things. For us, our principles are rooted in Iman, Islam, and Ihsan. Those are our principles. When we ground ourselves in those principles, and that we are able to get beyond our inferiority complex, is that we realize there's a responsibility on our shoulders to make principled contributions, uh, contributions based upon our own principles, wherever it is that we might be living. And they're going to take a different form in a different place, but we live here. And so it is important for us to have a portion of our knowledge seeking be to understand some of the nuances of the society in which we live so that we know we can make sure that we do the right thing. Now, and then we have this narration that also indicates the severity of this horrible trait and how that what is a trait of character, a vice, manifests in the day of judgment. So, in the world, is that a trait of character is not going to take on a form other than the things that we actually do. But in the afterlife, from the grave until Yom Al-Qiyamah, is that traits of character take on outer forms. And 
one of the examples of this as has come in a hadith, our Prophet said, is that the mutakabbirun, the people of pride, will be raised on the day of judgment like ants. Human beings, they'll be like the size of ants. Ya'luhum kullu shay'in min as And that they will be humiliated, obviously, in terms of their size and how they're trampled by the other people that are around them. So that great trait where they thought they were, because kibr comes from the word kabir. Kabir is to be large or to be great. And that could be actually in terms of size or it could be in terms of like station or someone thinks of station that they have. Is that it will actually that be reflected in their physical size on Yom al -Qiyamah. And then we have the Athar, which are the statements of the companions and those that come after them from the early generations. And Sayyidina Bakr Siddiq is known to have said, لا تحتقرن أحد من المسلمين Do not look down upon any Muslim. Do not look down upon any Muslim. Do not belittle them. Do not ridicule them. Do not look down on any Muslim. فَإِنَّ الصَّغِيرَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ كَبِيرٌ Because these insignificant Muslims that are great with Allah Jalla Jalalu because of their Iman. And look at this advice. This is the way, and this is the beautiful thing about the Athar. This is the way the companions who heard the verses of the Quran, they heard the statements of the Prophet They internalized those meanings. And then they have utterances of wisdom that have been informed by their knowledge of the Qur'an and of the Sunnah of our Prophet So what you tend to find is that they get a little bit more detailed. And they're detailed examples how we implement the meanings that we learn in the Qur'an and in the Sunnah of our Prophet And there's others. So Al-Hasan al-Basri, who was from the Tabi'een, the generation after the Sahaba. Al-Ajib ibn Ibn Adam. I'm amazed at the son of Adam, the children of Adam. يَغْصِلُ الْخُرَى كُمَّكُمْ اللَّهِ بِيَدِهِ كُلَّ يَوْمْ مَرَّةً وَمَرَّتَيْهِنْ Is that literally, he wipes himself after relieving himself once or twice a day. ثُمَّ يَتَكَبَّرْ يُعَارِدُ جَبَّارَ السَّمَوَاتِ And then he's going to act pridefully and in a sense, vie with the compeller of the heavens and the earth. Like, does that make sense? Is that this is one of the more humbling experiences. The very fact that Akramukum Allah, we have to use the restroom. And these are times that if you're not going to remind yourself outside of those times, one of the etiquettes actually is that when you're using the restroom, Akramukum Allah, you remind yourselves of your humility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am a humble servant of Allah, Jalla Jalalu. And that one of, the, one of them was asked, oh, excuse me, first, that, that Sayyidina Muhammad bin Hussein bin Ali, that he said, مَا دَخَلَ قَلْبِ بَرِيًا شَيْءٌ مِنِ الْكِبْرِ قَطْ إِلَّا نَقَصَ مِنْ عَقْلِهِ بِقَدْرِ مَا دَخَلَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ قَلَّ وَكَثَرَ As he said that, that no arrogance, nothing of arrogance, literally, will enter into the heart of a man and except that it will diminish from his intellect to the degree that it entered in smaller or lesser degrees. In other words, is that the greater the degree of, of kibbah, is that the more that it will diminish someone's aql, their intellect. And then, Salman al-Farisi was asked, is there a sayya, is there a bad deed that can't ultimately be helped by a good deed? And he says, al-kibr. And that shows the danger of kibr. Now, it's not an unforgivable disease. Of course not. But the point is, is that it's serious. Meaning that the traits of the heart that even if we're doing a lot outwardly, 
the righteous always focused more on the state of their hearts because they realized a small amount of deeds with a sound heart was much greater than a lot of things you're doing outwardly with a neglected heart. This is the way that this, they always have viewed this. The Sahaba to this day, the true people of Allah, to understand deen, this is how they understand things. Because they view it like a bucket. And that a trait like kibber is like a bucket that has gaping holes in it. You're putting water in by all the things you're doing outwardly, but a lot of it is just going right out. Right? So it's not that it doesn't benefit in some way, but it's just not going to be retained. And then he goes into a discussion of a specific manifestation of kibbutz. And I'm going to mention a couple of these narrations because it's so prevalent in our time. With what he calls al ikhtiyal And al ikhtiyal is a a way of walking or carrying yourself outwardly based upon this trait of kibber that is in your heart. And um, it's similar to the word tabakhtar. And tabakhtara in Arabic is to strut. So it's you, you walk a certain way. And this is something that we see. There are certain people that walk in a certain way. They strut around. And what do what do what do we what does the Prophet have to say about this? He says, "Is that بينما رجل يتبخذر في بردائه قد أعجبته نفسه إذ خصف الله به الأرض فهو يتجلجل فيها إلى يوم القيامة." Some of these narrations are serious, and we don't tend to like to hear the narrations that relate to. Uh, things like the fire, but it's important that we warn ourselves of it. It's so that when we see a certain type of behavior, we're not drawn into that type of behavior. Because sometimes there's a lure to it. You see people walking a certain way. And oftentimes a lot of athletes do this. A lot of celebrities do this. A lot of people that carry themselves in certain ways that other people want to be like in school, on TV, walk a certain way, carry themselves in a certain way, and we have to have that clarity like, A'udhu Billah, that's demonic. And I'm not going to be lured into that. And it's these narrations that's going to give you the strength at the level of the heart to see it for what it is. And so he said is that there was a man walking with the Prophet ﷺ that was wearing that certain garments, and he was clearly impressed with himself. And he says is that Allah Ta'ala caused the earth to swallow this person up and that he is going to be punished as a result of how it is that he was walking. And a, that another narration is that that Sayyidina Umar ibn Abdul Aziz before he became the Khalifa is that one of the that Tabi'een Tawus is that he saw him walking with a strut, Sayyidina Umar bin Abdul Aziz. And as he passed by him, Tawus pokes him like this. And he says to him, this is not the way someone who carries excrement in his stomach should walk. Right? And then Sayyidina Umar bin Abdul Aziz, we know, he was a very pious man. He says, yeah, um, he says, uncle of mine, he says, لَقَدْ ضُرِبَ كُلُّ عُدْوٍ مِنِّي عَلَى هَذِي الْمِشْيَةِ حَتَّى تَعَلَّمْتُهَا Is that they used to force me to walk like this from the time that I was young and would beat me if I didn't. And so I become accustomed to it. And so this was something he had to overcome. And there was a certain way that they trained royalty to walk. And they would actually be beat if they didn't walk a certain way. And other, the point is, people learn these in different ways. But then, that we have this other really beautiful story. Is that, that one, of the, uh, one of the righteous by the name of Mutarraf bin Abdullah ibn Shikhir, he saw an individual by the name of Muhallab, and he was strutting as he walked down the street with a beautiful garment. 
And he said to him, Ya Abdullah, that هَذِهِ مِشْيَةٌ يَبْغَدُهَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ This is a way of walking that is detested by Allah and His Messenger. And then Al-Muhallaf said to him, أَمَّا تَعْرِفُنِي? He says, Do you not know me? Right, this is like in street lingo, someone saying to someone, you better recognize. Like, do you not know me? Do you not know who I am? Do you know who you're talking to? How many times have we seen this? In movies, on television. How many times have we seen this? In most case scenarios, it's glorified. Where it becomes a character trait that people take on. Who do you think you're talking to? Do you not know who I am? As if that's part of manhood to act like that. A'udhu Billah. This is not the way a believer thinks. This is not how we speak. This is not how we think. These are terrible and reprehensible traits. This is a classic example of a trait that is detested by Allah and His Messenger. If we have to see it as such. If we don't know this, we're not going to be able to withstand the lure. Muslims don't strut around. We don't walk around arrogantly. However that strut is. Whether it's the strut of someone high up in office, or whether it's the strut of someone on the street, or anywhere in between. It doesn't just happen on the street. Don't just imagine that this is happening on the street. There are businessmen who walk like this in airports. There are the very wealthy people that walk like this right? As it, when they walk around. There are people that just because they're in business class is that they see these other people like cattle. It's, it's really like, I, subhanAllah, you would be so surprised. I, I, not too long ago, and I, I was just like amazed. I wish there was a way I could have, I don't tend to take out my phone and take pictures, but I, I wish I would have gotten videos of this because it was just amazing. So I was flying out of Newark. It was a late, it was a late flight. And when I was flying out of Newark, um, I usually fly United, so you have economy, you have Economy Plus, and then you have like uh, what's beyond that where it's like 1K. Uh, you know, we've fly, flown over 100,000 miles a year in special services. And then you have the, um, that, uh, uh, anyhow, you have different lines. So it was late, and they'd closed all the lines of security except one. So everyone had to go in together. So Madish, and you're in line and so forth. And then I was right there in the beginning, you just see people coming up. So the people that like Economy Plus would come up, and like, where's the Economy Plus line? And these poor people that were just telling people that the lines are closed, it's not them who made that decision. They're just telling people what lines to go in. People start freaking out. Where's the Economy Plus line? But the worst was when like the first class or global services people came. The reactions were different according to like their ranks in terms of like flight status. The people of like global services, like you want me to stand in line with these heathens? They obviously didn't say heathens, but like it was like they were so distraught. And like walking back and forth in line, pacing back and forth. And you know how like people who work inside can go to the front of the line. So if they saw someone get to go to the front of the line because they could actually go through, they were just going crazy and yelling at people and talking on their phone and they're all calling into United and I'm global services and I have to... It's just like, wow. SubhanAllah. Right? It, it's, it, you see what happens very easy. These things are triggered right off the bat. Let alone someone that has a private jet that has to fly on a plane with other people. People are like this. And you have to be very, very, very careful. And that you just, when you're, airports are amazing places for understanding the psychology of people. And just look at the way that people that are flying business class treat the flight attendants. The, the majority that I've seen there's like a whole persona that goes along, how you have to be. And many of them, just to be frank, are very rude. These poor flight attendants, they're just rude. And that the weird thing is, is that sometimes actually the flight attendants give better service to people that are rude. 
because they become conditioned, oh, that if someone's not like that, then I don't have to give them as good enough service. So sometimes it's internalized and then reciprocated, which is really odd. And then just basic humanity just goes. Well, you can't even, even longer be nice to someone because people will see that as a weakness and now I'm going to be a wolf. So what do you do in light of all this? Well, we definitely know what you don't do. We can rule that out. And then there's a range of acceptable things that you can do. Okay, but anyhow, it gets back to an understanding of this. So this person says, do you not know who I am? Okay, so he's walking arrogantly, he's strutting, he's wearing nice clothing, and Mutarif calls him out. He says, this, you're, the way you're walking is, not, is, is detestable to Allah and His Messenger. Do you not know who I am? And then he says, Bala arif, arifuka. This is one of my favorite stories. You've probably all heard me tell this. He says, yes, I know you very well. He says, I know you very well. He says, Awaduka nutfa madira. Your beginning was that you were a sticky fluid. Wa akhiruka jifa qadira. And your end, well, you will be a putrid corpse. Wa anta bayna dhalika tahmal al adira. In between these two states, your noble origin is a sticky fluid, and your end as a putrid corpse, you carry excrement between your two sides. You use the bathroom like anyone else. You don't have some special function where your excrement in your urine just vanishes in the air. Excuse me for being so frank. You do the same thing everyone else does that on a daily basis. So, كيف يعني? Like, how could you possibly be arrogant then if this is indeed your state? This is where Imam Ghazali goes into the trait of humility, and we're going to come back to that ta'ala, a little bit later on. But now, I want to look a little bit at the chapter that he titles, Bayanu Haqiqat al-Kibri Wa'afatih. And this translates as an exposition of the true nature of kibr and that w uh, in in and why it's a fault so he starts by saying i'lam no and al kibra yanqasimu ila dhahiran wa batinan there is both an external and internal reality to this trait of kibr fal batinu huwa khuluqun fi nafs so this chapter, he wants to define exactly what it is that we're talking about. So the internal reality of kibr is that it is a khuluq. It is a trait of character. And traits of character can be good or they could be bad. They could be praiseworthy. They could be blameworthy. Then there's an outward reality to kibr which stems from this trait of heart and leads one's limbs to do certain things. So he says, Wismu al kibri bil khuluq al batin ahak. This word kibr, it's better that we use that word to describe the trait that's inside the heart. Wa amma al a'mal, as for the outward things that we do, fa inna thamaratun li dhalik al khuluq. They are only, in a sense, fruits of that trait of heart. In other words, is that they follow the trait of heart. And so the source of these things that one does that one does outwardly is this trait of heart. And so the outward acts that one does, that's what's called takabur. So you have kibur and kibar is a mustar, it's a verbal noun, and tekabbur is also a verbal noun. But the tekabbur is everything that you do outwardly. And the kibar is the trait of heart. And so it's important that we understand what that trait of heart is, and then we understand many examples of how that manifests on the limbs. And then we look at our own selves. Do we do things similar to that? 
Now, the list of things that can be done outwardly are many. And he actually will go through that many of them, uh, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, Imam Ghazali. But it's not an exhaustive list. There could be other manifestations of it. But we have to first understand that. You have kibr, which is the trait of the heart, and you have tekabbur, which are the various things that you could do outwardly. Now, and so he says, if we're going to define the trait that is kibr, it's as it follows. Al-istirwahu wal-rukunu ila ru'yatin nafsi fawk al-mutakabbari alayh. Okay? And is, it's the state of heart where you find contentment in seeing yourself as better than the object of your kibr. So, simply, you see yourself as better than other people. فَإِنَّ الْكِبْرَ يَسْتَدْعِ مُتَكَبَّرًا عَلَيْهِ Is that this trait of kibr requires is that there be an object of pride. The one that you are showing that kibr to. وَمُتَكَبَّرًا بِهِ A cause of pride. وَبِهِ يَنْفَصِلُ الْكِبْرَ عَنِ الْعُجَبِ And this is how we differentiate kibr from ujab. How we differentiate pride from conceit or self-admiration. So there's a mutakabbaran alayh, there's an object of pride, that is who we show that kibr to, and there is a mutakabbaran bi, there is a cause of pride. And so there's certain things that the more we have them in our heart, is that it will lead us to show more kibr. And he repeats here what we've already said now, is that whereas ujab does not require that another person to be involved. It's just something that relates to your own self. He says, بَلْ لَوْ لَمْ يُخْلُكَ insan illa wahda." Were the human being to be the only person that has ever been created, is that you could see that person as conceivably that uh, self being afflicted with self-admiration. Whereas that you can't show kibr that unless there's someone else involved. Okay. Now, he goes on further to say that وَلَا يَكْفِي أَنْ يَسْتَعْذَمْ نَفْسَهُ لِيَكُونَ مُتَكَبِّرًا It's not sufficient for him just to be impressed with his own self to be considered to be a person who's متكبر. فَإِنَّ قَدْ يَسْتَعْذَمْ نَفْسَهُ وَلَكَنْ يَرَى غَيْرُ أَعْذَمْ مِنْ نَفْسِهِ Because someone could see himself as being special, but he sees someone else as being uh, greater than them. وَلَا يَكْفِي أَنْ يَسْتَحْكِ غَيْرَهُ فَإِنَّهُ مَعَ ذَلِكَ لَوْ رَعَى نَفْسُ أَحْقَرْ لَمْ يَتَّكَبَّرْ And it's not sufficient for him just to that see someone else as lesser because it's conceivable that he also sees himself as less. That it's a combination of the two. Is that he sees himself as something great or in a higher station and he's seeing other people as less than him. This is the essence of what this is. And th this is why our Prophet وسلم, is that he sought refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala min nafkhat al kibriya. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the nafkhat al kibriya, which is like this, this, this wind of thinking you're that better. The anafkhal is to, is to blow. And so you, like this wind. And what could happen is, you go through a moment of your life where someone praises you. It's very easy when someone elevates you then, oh, see? And you take that out on someone else. You get a brand new car. And then all of a sudden, you got to protect your heart. How are you when you drive by someone else? that's driving a car that's not like yours. A brand new house, a brand new garment, a brand new job. That these things, these, these could be nafakhat of kibriyat could happen at any time. Where you get this wind of this sense of, I'm better than so and so. And the Prophet sought refuge in that. And so it could come at some times more than others. Just as if you're outside in the environment and all of a sudden 
that a, a gust of wind comes through. We get these gusts, if you will, of that uh, of Kibriya. May Allah Ta'ala protect us. So then he says here, ثُمَّ هَذِي الْإِزَّةُ تَقْضَ لِعْمَانَ فِي ظَهْرَ بَاطٍ هِيَ ثَمَرَتُهَا Again, there's these outward dimensions of things that we do based upon this trait. And he says, this is called تَكَبُّر فَإِنَّهُ مَهْمَ عَظَمُ أَنُّ قَدْرُ بِالْإِضَافِ لِغِيرِ حَقَّرَ مَنْ دُونُ وَزْدَرَاهُ وَقْصَاهُ عَنْ نَفْسِ وَبْعَدُهُ So he's getting us down to really the psychology and walking us through what happens. Is that when we have these things that fuel or cause kibr, and it leads us to do these things outwardly. He says that as long as we think that we have a higher rank than someone else, that we are better than someone else, is that necessarily, is that we will then belittle other people. We will disregard them. We will look down upon them. And we will distance them from ourselves. وَتَرَفَّعَ عَنْ مُجَالَسَةِ مُمَآكَلَتِهِ we won't want to sit with them. We won't want to that eat with them, for instance. You don't want to be near them. In this case that I just mentioned, you don't want to be in the same line with them. You don't want to stand next to them. You want to be distant. You want to be in your nice gated community. And you don't even want anyone else to come in. Now there's obvious reasons some people have gated communities. But the point is, is that you have to be careful. You have to be careful. And, you know, the, the amazing thing is that in most traditional societies is that very wealthy people lived right next door to very poor people. In a traditional city, the poor and the wealthy were living amongst each other. If you look at Medina Munawwara, taking it way back, is that there were, the Prophet was listening, living right next to Ahl al-Sufa. Right next to Ahl al-Sufa. And we just took a hadith uh, last week uh, about one of the principles of fatua is to prefer people, to prefer some of the people that are close to you over at certain times even family members. And offering services to people and sometimes withholding from that, if there's indeed a choice that has to be made, from your own family members, with the obvious prerequisite that your family's on board, otherwise you can't do it. That's why it's such a lofty maqam, station. And there's multiple narrations, but in one of them, is that Sayyidah Fatima came to ask the Prophet ﷺ for a servant when he was given, when he had a lot of wealth come to him, ﷺ, that he was in to distribute. And... One of the narration states is that she was expecting. And when she was baking bread, because she was expecting, her stomach was getting burnt by baking the bread. And Sayyidina Ali was someone who used to let draw water out of a well. And so she comes to the Prophet ﷺ. And in one narration, she asks him directly. In another narration, she and Ali agree that she was going to go. And then she was embarrassed when the Prophet asked her you know, what she came for. And she just said, I came to send salams to you. And then, in that narration, the Prophet comes back to visit them. And we get details of what the household of Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Fatima was like. When they got married, the Prophet gifted them a blanket. He gifted them a water skin. He gifted them two mills. A leather pillow that had palm fibers as the cushion inside of it uh, and two mills to grind grain. That was pretty much the extent of their possessions unless Sayyidina Ali had something else. That was the extent of their possessions for their wedding. And this is the daughter of the best of creation. The best of creation, Sallallahu Alaihi And that in this narration, Sayyidina Fatima was using the mill so much she had sores on her hands. So she comes to the Prophet Sallallahu She's embarrassed, the Prophet comes to them. And then, that eventually the Prophet says to them, how can I give you a servant when I have Ahl Sufa to take care of and their stomachs are in pain from hunger? 
He says, how can, I, how can I give you a servant? He says, on the contrary, that I need to that get money so that I could take care of them. He says, shall I not indicate to you something that's better than what you're asking me for? And this shows us that the Prophet always wanted his close family members to only rely upon Allah, place no reliance whatsoever in the outward, in something related to the dunya. And this is where the Prophet gifts Sayyidina Fatima and Sayyidina Ali, saying, SubhanAllah, 33 times before you go to bed, Alhamdulillah, 33 times, and Allahu Akbar, 34 times. In other words, is that that servant that you wanted to help you in your day-to-day -day duties, if you say this, it will help you much more than that servant that you're... Meaning, reliance completely upon Allah. But it indicates here too that this, this great trait of Futua. But you can only do this if your family is on board with you. Anyhow, um, I forget where we were going with that, but... Um, Allahumma salli wa sallam adi wa ala adi. So that not wanting to sit with people, not wanting to eat with people. And then, وَرَآ أَنَّ حَقُّ أَنْ يُكُمْ مَاثِنَ بَيْنِ يَدَيْ إِذَا اشْتَدْ كِبْرُ Where there are some people who just think that, you know, these people just need to remain and stand there waiting for my command. Some people go to that extent. And again, this is where we get into all these modern forms of this. What is entitlement? Why do some people feel so much more entitlement than other people do? Why do some people feel like they own the road? This is their space. This is their society. This is their country. Where does that come from? It all comes from this. It all comes from this. If you are raised from the time that you're young, this is the best country in the world. This is the best country in the history of humankind. I'm not saying that we don't notice good accomplishments of the United States of America. But to reach the point where you don't care about your neighbors, let alone other people in the world, because you almost feel like you're the only place on earth, that is a serious problem. That is a problem. And if we can't recognize that in the public discourse, how are we going to do what needs to be done in the world to really achieve the goals that we speak about that we want to happen in the world? Really. Or is it just all jargon? Or is it just all used to get elected and none of it really matters? And it's not just politicians who are speaking like this. Or do we really care? Do we really care, really care about other people in the world? Do we? As individuals, we must recognize this. This is not a healthy discourse. And yes, I'm not saying we don't notice good that has happened. But we have to recognize what, we've been, what has been instilled in us from the time that we're young. And this is why that Hajj is such an important experience. Such an important experience. If you are mutakabbar, you're going to really struggle on Hajj. You're going to, re even if you get that $12,000 VIP package where you're separate and almost like your gated community in Mina, that, you know, now, if that's just where you're at and you need ease, okay, fine. But if you that are bothered by being around people that are missing toenails and are their feet are rugged, or don't smell like you, or their bags have broken wheels, or whatever else. There's a serious problem in your iman. A serious problem. We should love being with poor people. We should find consolation in being with poor people. As an ideal. Now how that plays out in our day to day, we need to work on that. But you should find intimacy in praying next to someone that lives on less than a dollar a day in the same masjid of the Prophet We shouldn't be bothered by that. We should love being with the Muslims in all the different shades and all the different cultures they come from. You should love that experience. And for some people, it's actually a test of their faith. Like, this is the faith that I've joined, all of these people? Right? 
not just this famous singer who became Muslim. Now I feel good that this singer affected, it, accepted my faith. We should be happy that anyone who becomes Muslim, anyone who becomes Muslim, we should be happy. And yes, from the standpoint that maybe they can affect other people so they become Muslim, okay. We'll give you a little bit of a license there. But you should be happy with the person down the street who was a crack baby and had a very difficult life that no one cares about. You should be just as happy that they became Muslim too. Otherwise, that where are our priorities? What are we really... right? So, he's getting down to what really is the essence of what this is. Is that if you are Mutakebba, you can't serve other people. You can't pick up after other people. You expect to be served. You expect other people to send salams to you. You expect people to make way for you when you are walking. You have to be given preference in a gathering. All of these different types of things. And he goes into a lot of other details here, is that you don't take admonition. You can't accept criticism. Accepting criticism is one of the main ways to determine are you, do you have this trait of kibbutz or not? If you realize who you are and you realize how short you fall all the time, we should be open to accepting criticism. And when you advise other people if there's tekebbor, You'll advise one person more harshly than another. Double standards. Someone that's like this, you're very gentle with them. Someone that no one cares about in society, come down hard on them. The, you would be surprised. I don't want to say watch carefully, because the whole point of this is to fix ourselves, not other people. But once you know this, you will be so surprised. I travel way too much. I notice these things day in and day out. Just on the plane that I was just on. Preferential treatment. Preferential treatment. That so and so that fits such and such a description can go use the bathroom in that business class and no one says anything. Right? Someone else that has a very different profile, no, you can't go in there. Why didn't you say that to them? But you said that to them? These things are reinforced on a daily basis. And how would you feel if you were the victim of that? every day of your life, multiple times. How would you feel? And how would you then protect your own heart? Because if we level the playing field, this is about everyone drawing near to Allah. From lashing out and returning other ways to the people of Kibbutz. So, this is very deep. This is why, how could this not be relevant? This is as relevant as relevant could be to our everyday lives. Because Imam al-Ghazali is talking about deep-set human psychology that transcends time and place. This is deep stuff that gets down into the depths of the way that we think and that things that happen that as a result of traits that we have and so forth and so on. And hastening to anger, all of these other types of things that indicate to us that certain, this trait of kibr, and there are many more, I think insha'Allah ta'ala, Allah, you never get through everything that you want to, but I think that we will go ahead and stop there. And um, if there's any quick questions, do we have a time for a few minutes of questions, Asabai? Just a few minutes of questions? If there's any questions, and then we can um, take a break and come back after, inshallah. Yes, please. What's your thoughts on, um, sort of like, gaming, and sort of when you're, like, see a lot of people playing Fortnite, and you kind of first play shooters and others, and it's almost like a micro giver kind of going on. So when you, like, kill someone, and then it's reinforced the idea that you're, like, a better gamer than them. And it's, it's obviously other things, too, because it's a uh, feedback loop. Yes, so I'll, I'll answer your question with, a, with an analogy of a, of a different reprehensible trait, like of riyat, ostentation. 
So, um, Riyā, when you show off in your worship, okay, it's, it's only sinful when it relates to worship. Okay? So technically, like if you're a good player of some sport, to show off a little bit on the football field or on the basketball court is not sinful in religion. It doesn't mean that it's something good. But the problem is, even though it's not necessarily sinful when you do that, is that who you are is who you are. If you do that on the basketball court, what's preventing you from doing it off the basketball court? Or whatever sport it is that you are playing. So this is really the problem with some of these things, even if we're going to say it's not necessarily sinful that when you're actually doing it, but it is definitely not something that is good. Right? Getting yourself accustomed to certain behavioral patterns will inevitably spill over into other aspects of your life. Um, and um, I, so I think that this is, these are classic examples of you know, things that we need to warn people of and that to temper people that, okay, maybe we're, we're, it's not a solution to get everyone off of Fortnite, but maybe we can at least remind people that, hey, you know, this is what you have to consider. And, um, you know, there's the, the general advice and then there's the way that you're dealing with you know, your own children. Because it, there, there's such a pull to these things. And it's so pervasive. Uh, at one level, there's nothing you can do other than try to mitigate. Even if you don't have a TV. Even if your kids don't have devices. It still gets to them. All it takes is one other child that has a device and shares it with everyone else. All it takes for them is to find someone on the bus that sits next to them and they're doing the same thing. It's almost impossible to keep your kids from these things. And the, so the way forward realistically is to spread awareness and remind people that, hey, you know, you need to be aware of A, B, and C. But th there's no doubt in my mind that these are not necessarily good things. They're not good things because you develop behavioral patterns that spills over into the other things that, that you then do. And um, um, so it's, 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 it's a problem. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. Yes, please. Um, when you were describing uh, What was that, sorry? When you were describing it as an ikhtial. Oh, ikhtial, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, um, and I, you know, to me, um, this is a whole other topic, but I think we need to scrutinize every word that we appropriate, i.e. use, okay? And be very clear on what we mean by that. And I'm not saying what you're just saying. I'm saying in general. So words like self-confidence, self-esteem, self-respect, many of these words that we hear used in modern psychological lingo, we have to understand exactly what we mean by them and understand them in our own unique frame, okay? And so um, I don't want to go too much into detail about that. I'll just kind of keep it general um, because there are certain aspects of self-confidence that we would validate as um, being important for the human being, but then there's certain aspects of it in modern psychology that we would probably reject. Right, or at least understand it slightly differently. Um, so I, I think that the main thing that we're taught is that we go out into public is that we carry ourselves with two traits, sakina and waqar. Those are the two main traits when you're in public, how you carry yourself with sakina and waqar. And those are roughly translated as uh, tranquility, and that's not really a, a good translation because Sakina is so much more than that. Sakina comes from sukun, stillness, calmness, are also words that, that might even be better translations. And waqar. And waqar is roughly translated as dignity. But dignity is understood culturally in different ways and in our society. In time. But what that means is, is that there's a certain way you carry yourself in public. Okay? 
you don't humiliate yourself as a believer. Okay? Nor do you show arrogance. So it's that balance between humiliating yourself and between that dealing arrogantly with people. There's a big difference between just kind of walking and just very like, oh my God, I'm among these people, and the, you know, like that, in between, strutting, right? As if there's a difference between those two. And so you're supposed to carry yourself, let's just use this word broadly, confidently. And what we mean by confidence is, is that you believe what you've been given is the greatest blessing of all. Belief in La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Your confidence is rooted in your trust in Allah. Not in your own ability. Your confidence is rooted in that I don't care what people think about me. I'm going to carry myself as I need to carry myself. Your confidence is rooted in hope. Not in a society that has privileged certain temperaments or has defined success in a specific way. Your confidence in that, even if I fail miserably in the conception of society, I could still be a success with Allah. So we have a very different understanding of what confidence is. And all of this is in your heart when you walk out into public. With a deep knowledge of what is right, what is wrong. And what is your purpose as a human being. What is the purpose of me interacting with everyone that is around me. And then, when you walk out like that, and you have this other trait of sakina, which comes from a heart that is filled with the light of dhikr that is filled with someone who's sent a lot of sadawat upon the Prophet that sees things very differently, realizes they're a stranger here in this earth, they're not going to be here long, that is someone that can control their temper, is that someone upsets them that they maintain their principles. Someone's rude to them, they kill them with kindness. That someone is short of money, they give them money. Someone who needs help, they give them help. Sakina includes all of these things. It's that stillness of your being. Because you have submitted to Allah. You walk by something that's haram. You lower your gaze. That there's an opportunity to do something good. You help. Someone's garbage can tipped over. You stop your car and you lift it up for them. All of these things stem from Sakina and Waqar. And there's a lot more that could be said. This is how we are uh, in public. And that you don't unnecessarily put yourself in a situation where you're going to be taken advantage of. So Sakina and Wakar does not mean that you're a pushover. Being nice is not always equivalent with good character. Being firm is sometimes just as important as being nice. Because when you go to work, you're going to be exposed to wolves. And good character is to not let a wolf devour you. If people are firm, you show a firm sight, you're not going to do that to me. You're not going to treat me like that. You show your firmness when people start to laugh or joke about how you are, or your religion, or something you can't do, or something like that, that you know how to carry yourself. And then there's all these other traits that come in when you're doing that. And I think this is one common misconception. When you encourage people to have good character, you think that it always means just to be nice and be a pushover. No. Right? Good character, it many times, means that you stand firm. That making sure that you or no one else gets bullied is the epitome of good character. We should ingrain in our children, if you ever see someone getting bullied, you stand up for that person. I don't care who that person is, what people are going to say about you. And you do that once or twice, and for the most part, people aren't going to mess with you. Or other people if you they know you're around. And even if you're smaller. Right? I personally think that our young people, men and women alike, should train not only in self-defense, but in some type of martial art. So they have confidence that they could defend themselves if need be. So good character does not mean that you're a pushover. And all of this is, but you have that true warrior spirit I know that's dangerous to say in our time. But a true warrior spirit is one of, is that you're a peacemaker. You don't want to fight anyway. But you will defend yourself and you will defend other people if the boundaries are transgressed against. And this is in line with 
American and Christian values too. And for us, any different, anything else to be expected from us is, is ridiculous. And so all of these meanings are included in Sakina and Wakar. So you're not strutting, but you're not just like, you know, walking around in a way that people are going to pick on you. You're carrying yourself with dignity. And recognizing your dignity is not in what other people think about you. It's that your dignity is that you are an abd of Allah. Your dignity is you are someone that is aligned with the will of Allah in terms of your belief, in terms of your practice, and in terms of your character. Now, all of that sounds great, but the key is to live up to it. It's not easy because we forget all of the time. We're going to be in a car, maybe when we go home, something happens, oh, bite your tongue. Right? So. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa ala. So up until now, we've tried to set the frame for our discussion of kibr and ujab and that why it is so important for us to study this and relating it to uh, much of what we're experiencing in the world today. And we spoke last session about a definition. And most of us have probably known that definition, but I do think that it was a very important distinction Hajjat al-Islam Imam al-Ghazali made in relation to the difference between kibr and tikabur. And it's important for us to know that there's a reality of this trait in the heart, and then there is a myriad of ways that that manifests on our limbs. Certain things that we say, ways that we look at other people, various things that we do, ways that we treat people, and so forth and so on. And so there's a lot of details. And again, I always want to reiterate is that we are just starting the process of how we have to approach this. And it is for this reason <coughs> that the scholars have reminded us is that a good percentage of our time learning should be exploring these topics because there's so much to explore in them. It takes a long time. It's not something that can be done easily in that a few hour session. Is that it takes time. And then you have to come back to them and remind yourself of them. And again, that this knowledge is a knowledge that is like staple food. It is something that you need every single day of your life. It is not like just putting a little bit of salt that on your main dish. This is something you need day in and day out. Day in and day out. There's, a, there's foods that you could go without that you could still survive if you do not eat them. And then there's foods that you need to let nourish yourself and to stay alive. And this science, which is broadly from the science of Ihsan, is that science. We need to be doing this daily. It's very easy to learn basic creed, which, what it is that you believe, believe in. It's fairly easy to learn the ahkam of the sharia, the legal rulings of the sacred law that you need on a day-to-day -day basis. That does not take that much time to do. But this science requires a long-term investment little by little, that you learn the concepts at a basic level, and then you spend time reflecting upon them. And again, you understand how those things manifest in your particular time, and you specifically think about how it relates to you as an individual. And over time, it will become more and more clear, more and more clear. And then, once you spend the time doing it, it will be like that person at first, when they tried to recite the Qur'an, they thought they were reciting it correctly. But you sit before a master and you realize, my God, I can't even pronounce the Fatiha properly. And this is the way that you will let view your religious practice. Like, my God, it's been stained with these reprehensible traits for years. And it starts with that knowledge and it's followed up by an intention. And then hard work that is put in over time. Khair, inshallah. So let's continue on <coughs> in our study. And now that we are going to look at um, the objects of kibr. And this is what he refers to as the mutakabbar 
alayh. So the mutakabbir is the one who shows kibar. The mutakabbar alayh that is the one who is the recipient of that kibar. And <clears throat> there's three degrees that he speaks of. The worst is the kibar that someone shows to Allah Jalla Jalalu, to our Creator. And so that this is the very worst thing that a human being <clears throat> can possibly do. And the worst manifestation in history of that is that of the Pharaoh who said, Ana Rabbukum al -a'la, That I am your Lord Most High. We a'udhu billah. And this exists archetypally, and we keep using this word because it's an important word. This it exists as an archetype potentially in every human being. Every human being has the potential to rise to the A'la Iliyin or fall to the Asfada Safilin. Every human being has the potential to also say Anna Rabbukum al A'la either explicitly or their state is saying this, or that they could be a servant of Allah Ta'ala in all of their different states, like Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu So this is the human potential. And in the end, <clears throat> there's only two ways. There's the way of guidance, and then there's the way of misguidance, in the end. And there's the way of nur, and then there is the plural ways of lunamat, all of which in reality are one. That they're all manifestations of darkness. You have darkness and you have light. And you will see this manifest time and time again, day in and day out. And this is what we ultimately are choosing that on, on a regular basis. Which category do we actually fall into? And that many... Of, and this is, this is a classic example of how you have to bring this principle into conversation with the modern world. And yet we don't have time to do this because you could spend the whole afternoon simply speaking about this first category as an object of tekebbur, of pride, how it relates to disbelief in our time. And that you could very easily show how the many different types of atheism, because atheism is not a monolith. Uh, there is a book by John Gray titled The Seven Types of Atheism, where he details that the many different types and ways that people that disbelieved and or that branded themselves or were branded as atheists. And there's different types of atheism. And that some of them more severe than the others. So it's not a monolith. And that, especially with certain types of atheism, this is one of the fundamental causes. Kibur, it comes in the way of them in belief. And one of the worst types of these various people who that disbelieve in Allah are those who look out at Allah Ta'ala's creation, do not see it as wondrous, and actually that find many faults in it and actually think that through modern technology they can do better than Allah. And there's actually people that are like that. And there's probably a disproportionate amount of those people in this valley where we are. Um, <clears throat> and they're all over the world and in the, throughout the United States. But you'd be surprised is that it's almost like a religion for people. And that some of these people, when you hear them speak, it's just sheer arrogance. Sheer arrogance. And unfortunately, that these people are affecting that larger numbers of people. And that the challenge is, is that with their technology, they can sometimes work like what seems to be miracles. So it's confusing to people because it seems like they can almost back up their claim with a magic-like form of technology that seems to actually that cure or to that be able to that change something that they thought was that unable to be altered. And so this is a real fitna. And this all is 
undoubtedly a precursor to the greatest fitna of all, which is the Messiah Dajjal. And um, whenever we have discussions like this, we also have to tie them into these broader trends, the details of which are so many, there's so many details, that we've been introduced to this, especially those of us that have been privileged to learn from Sheikh Hamza Yusuf from early days, that to a very good general knowledge that of this, and that what we need to do is follow up with that, where we understand the principles of what to do with it, and how we can mitigate the harm of the time in which we live, that knowing that we are experiencing tendencies that are that precursors to the Dajjal. Now, when is the Dajjal going to come? That's not uh, really important. What's important is, is that we protect ourselves that from the evil that precedes him. And there are principles. There are ways that through inductive reasoning you can look at all of the different narrations and then you can develop that a, a very practical approach to certain things. And there are authors who have done this. One of the greatest is Habib al Bukhar al-Adni and Mashur, who has several texts that teach us about what he calls fiqh tahawalat, and which is another name essentially for the signs of the end of time. And he refers to it as a type of fiqh, a type of understanding. And there are many principles in this understanding that you can very easily bring into your life. And for instance, uh, that he noticed that in many of the narrations that relate to times of fitna, he said that he noticed there was constantly a mentioning of shedding of blood and movement of the tongue throughout the narrations. So he says that one of the great ways to know who are the people of truth in any fitna, who are the people that are blowing on the fire of fitna with words, and who are the people involved in the shedding of blood, and who are the people that are withholding. This is one of the great ways to know who are the people of truth. Any time that there is fitna, is that you'll find the true people of Allah are extremely cautious about what it is that they say and what it is that they don't say, what it is that they choose to clarify and what it is that they realize when they attempt to do so, it's going to potentially bring about greater confusion. And so sometimes when the water is murky, the only solution is to let it, to refrain from doing anything about it until that murkiness naturally dissolves. And then you can reach in and grab your keys or whatever it is that you dropped. Whereas if you, when it's murky, put your hand in the water, it's going to make it worse. And knowing when to do what, this requires fiqh in the deen. Not necessarily in terms of halal and haram, this is makru, a, the broader meaning of fiqh. This requires understanding of the deen. And it is absolutely essential. And there are so many people that neglect this, and very few that even when they don't neglect it, have a methodology on how they approach these things. There is a clearly outlined prophetic methodology for times of fitna. When you start to understand that, that you will start to see who it is that you should be following in these times and who it is, is that you want to that distance yourself from. And this is just an example. And there's many other principles of this as well. So this is the very worst type of kibr is a kibr that gets in the way of your belief of Allah wa ta'ala. And that, again, that there are many different manifestations of this, but this is the worst, because who are you? Who are you to put into question the divine will? And sometimes certain positions that we take on certain things are nothing other than the result of this reprehensible trait in the heart. It's not a matter, really, of rational thinking. And then secondly, <clears throat> is a takabbar ala rusul. This is the second division, which is pride towards the messengers. Where that you start to put into question why you've been commanded to follow another human being. 
he's just a human being like I'm a human being? Why would I follow another human being? And multiple verses in the Quran point to this type of psychology. Are we going to believe in two human beings like us? You are only a human being like us. If you follow a human being like you, you're going to be in loss. And then, وَقَالُوا لَوْ لَا أُنزِرَ عَلَيْهِ مَلَكِ Were there not to be an angel that sent down upon him, and so forth and so on. مَا لِهَذَا الرَّسُولِ That what is with this messenger? He eats food, and he walks in the marketplace. And if you really think about that, Rasulullah, there were people who that had kibr, and their kibr blinded them from believing in the messenger of Allah. That's hard for us to believe knowing what we know about the Messenger of Allah. But precisely because of the reprehensible nature of this trait, it should be hard for us to believe if you don't have that trait. But if you do, you're not going to see things as clear as day, the way other people see things. You'll be blinded. And that you will be prevented from belief, oftentimes from that. And so there are that another category of people and I would probably say more in our time that the bigger problem for people is belief in God. Um, and maybe it's because they're so preoccupied with that that there is less attacks that on prophets. This is just my hunch. I could be wrong. And maybe if that was a given, maybe that would th this would arise more in terms of the kibra that is shown in relation to the messengers. Uh, but this is this will come in the way. And then there are subtle ways that this is done as well. And when people start to put into question the universal nature of the prophet's message, and that they think that this was someone who lived in the Arabian Peninsula 1,400 years ago, right? you really want me to seek guidance from someone who lived before the age of information and the age of rockets and that technology where we can go into space? And you really want me to believe in someone that's that far back? And if you look at the way that the vast majority of people look at the past, look at the difference between the average Muslim and the average non-Muslim and how they view the past. Right? We are reading a book. Do you realize how old this book is? Like, we are reading a book that is about 950 years old. 950 years old. You couldn't even understand English that was written 950 years ago. Like, 950 years old. And those trained in classical Arabic will understand this better than understand a modern Arab newspaper. This language is very clear. And we know exactly what Imam Ghazali is saying, for the most part. Now, we're not claiming that we understand the genius of how he crafted his work, but his language is very clear. Very clear. We know what these words mean. There's very few expressions in the entire Ihrayl al-Madin where there's some degree of ambiguity. There's a few, but very few. 950 years old. Now, what work are people really reading? Now, I'm not talking about the Bible. Let's put the Bible aside. That what works are people, maybe the Catholics have more of a sense of this, where they'll read the books of St. Augustine and so forth. Um, but the vast majority of people, something written 50 years ago seems so far off, a long time ago. We are reading a book that's, that's very old. And there is this sense in the modern world where we've been duped by plastic words like progress, where we think that as time goes on, that we're looking forward. And one uh, part of the upshot in terms of perspective that is, is that we belittle and look down upon the past. And we don't think about this, is that 
when you look at black and white videos, is that it's almost that we think their world didn't have color because that's how we see it. It looks so outdated, but it was just in black and white. They would have had just as much almost color as we would have had, so as if the sun didn't ever shine. Right? But you can't see if it's black and white. So even the way visually that we connect to the past, it creates this sense of almost like denigration, looking down upon the past. Tradition is not a positive word, according to most people in English. People associate it with culture, or he's just hanging on to tradition. In some senses, it still retains a positive sense, but nothing like the way of the past. So my point is, is that there are people that because of their view of the past, that is almost like a type of kibber that's very subtle, that they look down upon the past and find it far-fetched, that they can find guidance in a messenger that came over 1400 years ago in what is in their mind a geographically insignificant place in the middle of the desert to a almost Bedouin-like people? Like, how could I ever get guidance from someone like that? Whereas that exact same thing for a Muslim could actually be the proof of them, which is amazing. It was one of the miracles of the Prophet that he lived in, a, in the minds of people geographically insignificant place. Mecca is not geographically insignificant. We call it the Umm al-Qura, the mother of all cities. Or a more idiom idiomatic translation would be the embryonic city. It's the center of the world. Is that the Bayt al-Ma'mur, the populous house which is in the seventh heaven, 70,000 angels enter and they go in and they worship Allah and they go out in a new 70,000 which indicates a multitude that can't be known, not actually 70,000. That we have narrations that indicate were a rock to be dropped from the populous house, it would fall upon the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the center of the spiritual world. And that was the Prophet honored to be born in Mecca because of the Kaaba? Or was the Kaaba honored because the Prophet ﷺ, it was determined that in pre-eternity that the Prophet would be born there? The latter, of course. And there's a Quranic proof. When Allah Ta'ala says, لا أقسم بهذا البلد وأنت حلون بهذا البلد Allah swears by this blessed land and you, O Messenger of Allah, are a resident of this land. Is that Allah Ta'ala caused the whole, the whole protection of the Kaaba, the story that we all read, is one of the irhasat, the pre-prophetic miracles of the Rasul. And as again, there's an ishara in the Quran. Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka. Allah could have said, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala Allah. Have you not seen how Allah he says, Rabbuka, ka is the Rasul. Have you not seen how your, O Messenger of Allah, Lord, that did you not see what he did with the Ashab al fil with the companions of the elephant? This is the true perspective. And that, you know, there's no doubt that the Kaaba is that one of the greatest, that Sha'ar of Allah wa ta'ala of all. And in the discussion of whether Mecca is better than Medina or Medina is superior to Mecca. In those conversations is that always they set aside the Kaaba itself and the Rasul. Because even those that say that Mecca and Mukarramah is better, there is no place better than that blessed place where the Prophet is buried, unconditionally. And even those that say that Medina and Munawwara is better than Mecca and Mukarramah, is that they make as in uh, uh, an exception of that, the Kaaba itself. And they mean by that what's around it. And so, anyhow, is that this is how we have to view the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so, it's a miracle that Islam came in this geographically pure region where language could be preserved, where the unadulterated teachings of the Prophet could be preserved. And it's a sign just as him being unlettered outwardly, 
was a sign that Allah is the one that taught him likewise the geographical mer mer the, uh, n miracle of the Arabian Peninsula was in that it was impenetrable. People didn't come from outside there. So where did he come with this? And there were small exceptions to that, but it wasn't at the crossroads of a trading post like Jerusalem, for instance, or in another place in the world. So anyhow, or in the pre-modern world, a place like Alexandria or whatever. Anyhow, is that for us, what makes other people believe proves to us what we believe about him is that he received revelation. But again, keep in mind, we are in a society that very few people, even if they believe in God, don't really believe in revelation. Or they have a very convoluted understanding of what revelation is. Because that we are, that have received a society that has placed the human intellect over revelation for the most part. There's a few religious people hanging on. But, for the most part, people have placed the intellect over revelation. And that there are serious consequences of that. Whereas for us, is that we have a very different view of the past. We are taught to honor the past. In fact, our problem is really one of, okay, let's not live in the past and just speak so highly about the past that it blinds us of what we have to do in the present. And it, let's not forget that we have to connect to them, understand their principle, but actually part of the idea of tradition, the major part is to do what they did in their time in our time. The reason we connect ourselves to it is because we have to have clarity of the principles that they had. But then we have to do in our time what they did in their time. Otherwise, you can't really call that a tradition. We are required to do in our time what they did in their time. And again, that you could say, oh, they're a lot better than us. Yes, even if they're better, even if we that are always, in a sense, dwelling upon how horrible the times are, they did this from the time of Imam Ghazali and even before. You see statements like this from the earliest period, where even statements of the companions say, is that you say things now that we used to consider hypocrisy in the time of the Prophet is that saying things like, is that were the people that I sought to see you, they would say, there is no, you have no portion in the hereafter. <laughs> and these are tabi'in. So those will always remain. And they serve their purpose. But it doesn't mean that we don't somehow find inspiration in the past four than what we need to do in the present. We absolutely have to do that. So anyhow, I've probably gone into a little bit too much detail, but there's much more that could be brought out here. This is just an example. And the way that someone's kibr could come in the way of their belief in the Rasul. But I'm not just talking about people that are not Muslim. Muslims fall into this. That tend to be on more of the spectrum that you could call modernist and maybe even secular. Is that they, they tend to be more on this spectrum and they want to preserve their belief in Allah and the Messenger, but they reconcile they're being lured into a, a modern, the, the dominant perspective in the modern world of progress and somehow this is somehow great for humanity in every respect. I'm not saying there's not some good in it. But somehow that this is what history has been waiting for. And if this is what history has been waiting for, subhanAllah, I don't know what it is that you are seeing. Because once you tap into true meaning and the way that human beings should be living, yeah, you will put much of this into question. How is it really helping us? How is it really helping us? It can potentially. But, you know, when you, you know, this to me was one of the greatest blessings of going to the remnants of a pre-modern society in Mauritania. Where your worldview just completely, completely flipped upside down. People's conception of Mauritania and the way that they would view this country, which was then the second poorest country in the world, and the stereotypes amongst Muslims, I'm not talking about non-Muslims, Muslims themselves. And then you go there and you experience things from these people. Who's civilized and who's not civilized? I'm not talking about the small things like maybe cleaning their mouth on their robe or something like that, which is a minor thing. They overlook all of that. 
in some of the things that relate to cleanliness and so forth. That's, they're Bedouin people. But I personally don't know a people that's more civilized, depending upon how you define that word, than these people. All of the traits of heart that they have, how in touch they were with nature, how close they were to the fitrah, their relationships and how beautiful they were. And I don't want to let over-exaggerate because they have problems too. But the point is, is that it's nothing like what people thought. And when you start to see this beauty, which is unexpected to a certain degree, then your whole perspective starts to shift. Like, what do we really need? We used to be, we, have, we had a water ration. 20, some people had 30 gallon baydoons, which is basically like a, a container of water. 20 liters for about two or three days of water. And so that's just basically, you know, a plastic container about that big. And that's all of your water for drinking, for washing, for everything. And they would go and get it in the morning, and that's it. If you run out, you have to borrow your neighbors. Right? There's no. But you realize, like, how much water we waste. We go through that in one shower. Right? How much water we waste. And, like, what do you really need as a human being? Right? When I first moved there, we literally went down, cut down trees, and built a tent. And yes, it was hard. You know, you're, you're not living in luxury. There's no electricity, no running water. But you're, you're not, you're surviving. I mean, what, do you, what is the whole purpose of having a house? To save you, to protect you from the elements, to provide that privacy. Like, what else do you need? Like, what else do you really need? So our whole understanding of what we need and what we don't need and it is, is, totally, is totally skewed. And many of these technologies that we absolutely rely on, we would be much better. And it's proven much, more, much healthier without. <laughs> much healthier without. Psychologically and physically. But still, we've bought into this myth that this is how it's somehow better than us. And this is a major factor, even with Muslims. And the best of these categories that I mentioned, well, those that were reconciled because they don't want to lose their belief in the Prophet, that was for his society, but now things have changed. And so, that, that, that okay, we have to change the deen to fit into the time in which we live. And that seems to be like a minor thing, but it has major implications. Because what do you mean by change the deen? Um, if you mean by extending the unchanging principles into the present in interpreting <clears throat> the modern world vis-a-vis -vis those principles, I'm with you. But if you mean by that that you have to change some of those unchanging principles, which by definition can't change, and to modify them for the modern world, I'm not with you. Because... Every Muslim, every human being should think like this, I would put forth, is that the modern world as a marker of success is simply not a starting point for me. It's not a starting point. Whereas for the vast majority of people on earth it is. It's a starting point. Things are so great, look how horrible things were in the past. Whereas it's not a starting point for us is we have a very different conception of history. Anyhow, there's a lot more details that could be said about that, but this is the second that object of Kibba, which is pride that is shown towards the messengers. Okay? And then the third is pride that is shown towards Allah's servants. And what Imam Ghazali, <coughs> radiallahu anhu, that he says here, is that there are, that this is a very severe thing for two reasons. One of them we've already spoken about. And this is because this trait solely belongs to Allah Jalla Jalala. We can have no share in it. Unless we have this trait and apply it in a very different sense. So if you look at the books that explain the 99 names of Allah, one of the 99 names is al mutakabbir and in many of these books, <clears throat> they mention, after defining what it means for Allah to have that trait, 
what is our quote unquote share in that trait. And sometimes we have a direct share. What I mean by that is certain traits of Allah like al karim the generous. We can be generous. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. We can be merciful people in a very limited and relative way. But in some of the other traits that we really don't have directly a part in, they apply in a different way. And this is one of them. And so, for instance, Imam al-Ghazali, who has a commentary on the 99 names, he says, is that our quote-unquote share in the name of Allah and mutakabbar is the takabbar that we have in relation to the dunya and its desires. In other words, is that we see this as too lowly to be a place of focus. And you just disregard it. So not in relation to people, but in relation to dunya in all of its manifestations, specifically the desires. Tatakabbar aleha is that you don't see that as worthy of your attention. That's how we manifest this name of Allah al which is really a very beautiful meaning because it's not associated with people. It's associated with the pull towards the things of this world that lies deep within the nafs. And then the second reason is here is that pride leads to <coughs> opposing Allah Jalla Jalalu, which is one of the worst things you can possibly do is to oppose Allah. And sometimes that relates to disbelief and other times that relates to that falling into sin and one of the classic examples that is a Quranic example is that and when it is said to him that ittaqillah have taqwa of Allah akhadatul izzatu bin ithm is that his pride that causes him to persist in sin whereas if someone tells you ittaqillah what are you doing that should shake you. It, absolutely. I need to think about this. But for other people, you say that, what? Right? You tell me, what? It makes people have an uncontrollable response on top of that. And so this is why you got to be careful. If you're ever getting, if, if the moment's heated, you got to be careful about what you say. Uh, and you have to speak in a way that's going to diffuse the situation. You do not want to make it worse. And so um, that's very hard, and sometimes in the moment we don't make the right decision, but we have to do the very best that we can. So then there are that a lot of details that relate to this, but ultimately we have to recognize is that this is the essence of the demonic archetype, kibbutz. And scholars differ, what was the first sin committed? Was it envy, or was it kibber, or was it pride? But anyhow, this is the demonic archetype. What did he say to Adam when he was created? Ana khayrun minhu. I am better than him. So the whole foundation of racism, judging someone solely because of the color of the skin, and all of the other things that relate to that and that stem from it, it is a hundred percent demonic. Ana it was Shaitan who said that. Ana. And that the word for narcissism in Arabic is Ananiya. I. Focusing on me. I. And uh, some of them have brought out a Latifa, even in English on why in English do we never have I lowercase when it's alone. It's always capitalized. Because there's only supposed to be one I. And in relation to our own selves is that we should never assert the I. Right? That the only true I is La ilaha illa ana. There is no God but I. So shaitan uses this word, ana, I am better than him. And then he rationalized it. خلقتني من نار وخلقته من طين. You created me from fire and you created him from clay. 
And when it comes to elements, fire is superior to clay. So he rationalized it. This sounds so familiar. And so much of the history of the past three to four hundred years that we are living in. Rationalization. And when you study this at the academic level, and that you look at what exactly happens, there's always rationalizations, because people are human beings. If you can rationalize the killing of people, then it's easier for you to bear. It weighs less on your conscience. But it's a demonic thing to do. That is the shit. That is a demonic archetype. That's exactly what Shaitan did. And that this is not that true, that intellect. True intellect is that which is subjugated to wahi, to revelation. That if it was merely about the elements, even though clay is an inferior element to fire, Allah chose to bless Adam through the divine choice. And the divine choice is ultimately what dictates what is best. Nothing else. It's a very important principle. What indicates afdaliyah, what is best? The divine choice. Allah wants to make a specific place Mubarak and blessed. Why? Allah made that place Mubarak and blessed. Period. Allah gave the Prophet ﷺ what he gave him, made him the best of creation, made him the measure of all greatness, even in terms of how we experience the bliss of paradise, is only in accordance to how we relate to the Rasul ﷺ. Our Prophet is the measure whereby which all other greatness is, ter is determined. And to the degree of closeness to him is to the degree of greatness, period. And so, this is why, and I've said this before, I think, in California, but it, it proves this point. When we talk about the best water in existence, what do the scholars say it is? The best water in existence. Most people would say Zamzam. People would say, you probably heard me, you're cheating, you know that. <laughs> that that some, most, a lot of people say like the Kauthar. And... That's, those are very true. Those are very great types of water. But أَفْضَلِ الْمِيَاءِ مَعُنْ قَدْ نَبَى بَيْنَ أَصَابِ النَّبِيِ الْمُتَّبَى The very best water is the water that flowed by way of miracle from the blessed hand of the Rasul. And why? Because it was connected to his essence. His hand is connected to his heart, which is connected to his essence. And then, which is better, the water of Kauthar or the water of Zamzam? Zamzam, again, you've heard me say this. Zamzam is better because this was the water that was chosen. When the blessed heart of the Prophet ﷺ was cleansed, what was used? Not water from Kauthar, it could have been the Kauthar. Allah is qadir ala kulli shay. Jannah and Nar created now. Allah could have brought water from the Kauthar. But he brought Zamzam. And so because it was closer to the Rasul and used in those moments that was about honoring the Messenger, if there would have been a better water, that water would have been used. So it's the second best. And then the Kauthar. And then we have narrations that indicate the Nile of Egypt, the Mabakat and Huri, and then other that rivers are all the same at that point. So he is the criterion whereby which all greatness is measured. It's from him, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Anyhow, so this is a very important principle. Allah made Adam better. But shaitan refused to submit to that. And then on top of that, rationalized it. Think about the implications of this. How much that is pulled over people's eyes in our time because, oh, that actually makes sense. Yeah, you're right. But there's something that underlies that. And there's a lack of willingness to submit, which is the essence of what faith is as opposed to disbelief. 
And then once you've flattened the plane, then it's just merely about intellect. And no longer is there something that's super rational or something that has to guide the intellect. If it operates in its own space, it's going to make all different types of mistakes. There's no doubt about that. And so from this perspective, even when we talk about certain legal rulings of the Sharia that other people are uncomfortable with and think are illogical or irrational or horrible, is that when you understand our own, if you will, call it philosophy of law, it makes perfect sense and it's totally rational and totally logical from our perspective. They just don't believe in some of our own underlying assumptions. But you can't say it's irrational or illogical or even bad. If you look at our perspective and how we explain things, it not only makes sense, it's very convincing. So really the issue is not with this, it's with what underlies it. And this is very, very important. The vast majority of issues that people have in terms of social manifestations of things Muslims do or legal things that they have problems with actually point to much deeper conversations that are really where the problems lie. And it trickles down into these things. And this is very important that we treat it at its root. So this is the demonic archetype. And that it shows you how that when you have this trait of heart, is that you will fall into all of these manifestations of tekebbur in relation to people. And this is why he follows up this topic. And... Um, We'll try to cover this in the last part of the class in the next 10 to 12 minutes and then open it up for Q&A. Where now he discussed Bayanu ma bihi takabur And that these are the main causes of kibr. What are the main reasons people that, what are the main causes? What are the main reasons people that are, that fall into kibr? And like always, he wants us to understand the broader context. And he says, I'lam, no, أَنَّهُ لَا يَتَكَبَّرُ إِلَّا مَنْ إِسْتَعْضَ بِنَفْسَهِ Is that you don't ever act pridefully towards someone else or show arrogance toward them unless you first think yourself as great. وَلَا يَسْتَعْضِمُهَا إِلَّا وَهُوْ يَعْتَقَلَا سِيفَةً مِنْ سِيفَاتِ الْكَمَا And you're not going to think yourself as great unless that you believe you have in yourself one of the traits of perfection. And again, this is all, like if you look at what he says, this is just as relevant today as it ever was. Just as relevant. We just don't think about it in these terms. And we get confused because of the way that it manifests. And quite frankly, many of us that see things the way that they're being portrayed in the modern world, this is how we see things. And we're trapped. But this is a blessing for us to attempt to get out. And so he says, is that, And he says, is that this all gets back to various types of religious and worldly perfections. Excuse me. And he says, religious perfection essentially is in two things. Ilm and Amal. Knowledge and an action. And an action includes a lot of different things. Worship and then anything that is that we do outwardly. So Ilm and Amal. And then the worldly aspect of perfection is in related to someone's lineage, their physical beauty, their strength, their wealth, and their associates. So all these total of seven things, so knowledge, your, your knowledge, your religious deeds, your lineage, your physical beauty, your strength, your wealth, and your associates. Literally, kathratid ansar. Right? You roll deep. You have a lot of people Right, on your side. So the people you associate with, who is going to help you? These seven things are the main causes of kibber. And so what he does is he goes through each one of these. 
and he analyzes it and he shows in great detail how knowledge causes us to potentially have kibbutz how our religious deeds cause us to potentially have kibbutz and the other ones are so obvious we don't even really need an in-depth explanation of them all you have to do is just really think about them in a very basic way is that we know that because of someone's descent that someone of noble lineage and this is maybe decreasing to a certain extent in our time but even if you rewind 50 years even in this country is that the family someone is from is oftentimes a cause of their mistreating other people they're not from that same family and many of us are from geographical locations where this is definitely the case and it is sometimes slightly nuanced to be a little bit fair because you do have a conception in the Shafi school which is controversial because it's not in other schools of kafa'a which is a suitable match which to a certain degree recognizes sometimes social norms but we have to understand what that is placed there for it's actually placed there to protect potential relationships from going sour because of human limitations as opposed to what is the very best place be, best place to be ideally is that to have that different people that enter into relationships from very different social backgrounds is a beautiful thing why because it's a sign of allah it's a beautiful thing now our deen is ultimately practical so while we encourage the best thing there also has to be rules that regulate people that can't live up to what is best so in so far as those rules are used there to regulate recognizing is that this is kind of a base level and there's a better way to be is that then there's no problem but even when those rules are there to regulate there are certain limits never can you ever think even if you are from a more prominent family you are from a good lineage is that somehow you are inherently better than someone else this is a serious problem because you don't know these things are hidden to you it could be someone that's from the worst possible lineage worst possible lineage that reaches the highest degree of closest to allah jalla jalla and that is highly possible anyone every single human being no matter what their circumstances and how they were brought into this world has the same <clears throat> potential as every other human being the adamic potential is the same for every human being to attain ma'rifa and knowledge of allah that is what true success is not what your salary is or the college that you go to or the degree that you have or how prominent you are in society none of that matters in reality and i'm not saying there's not a way that we deal with that hour that we put everything in its proper place i'm not saying you don't send your kids to college or encourage them to have good jobs i'm not saying that but while you do all those things you have to recognize they don't matter what matters is your state of heart what matters if you come to know allah if you have a lot you have everything if you know allah you have everything if you know the prophet you have everything you will be the richest person in existence if you know allah al ghina ghina al qalb true wealth is wealth of the heart we all know this but we have to be reminded and so that lineage and descent and then wealth this is obvious as well that wealth obviously is a means to make people that more arrogant is that once that wealth comes and all the privilege that comes along with it the people that have less privilege you become more and more exclusive and the, and <clears throat> these things are all intertwined once you're accepted into these exclusive clubs and all of a sudden other people are not is that this becomes a disease of elitism where that anyone that's not going to bump up your status you have nothing to do with you have don't want to look at them 
you completely disregard them. Unless all of a sudden comes across, oh, that person can bump me up a notch. And now, whew, I'm going to turn towards this person. This is disgusting. It is completely disgusting. And that we don't think there's elitism in our day and age? Oh my God. That this world in which we live is rampant with this. Rampant. And it's a disease. And once it overcomes you, it's like someone seeking fame. You'll do anything to achieve it at that point. Anything. And again, what we're specifically talking about here is kibar. Is that it will lead you to think yourself as better than others. And the plebeians who are on the outside is that you don't want to have anything to do with them. So this is a fitna. The more wealth that comes, the more susceptible we are to kibber. The thing thing is with our physical beauty. Is that if someone is beautiful, is that they have to be careful. This is a gift that Allah gave them. But what do they do with that gift? How do they view other people that don't look like them? How do they, when they get a lot of attention and people get less attention, how do they deal with that? Is this going to be a veil for us or not? We have to be very careful. The more physical beauty that someone has, is that the more susceptible we are as well. And sometimes these factors combine. Good descent, physical beauty, and wealth, and it becomes an even greater fitna. Sometimes intelligence combines with these things, and so forth and so on, and it becomes that different, there's different degrees. And all of these things... If you don't think these things are prevalent in our society, I don't know which society you think we're living in. Right? Our world is rampant with these things. And much of what you see taking, uh, taking place out there, this is, the, this is what underlies it. And then we have strength, physical strength. And this is also, there's clear examples of this. People that like to work out in the gym. And again, I'm not saying that you don't work out in the gym. I'm not saying that you don't maintain a level of physical fitness. But what I'm saying is, is that, that this is that a fitna. If someone becomes physically strong, is that there's a whole way of being that goes along with it. There's a whole way of being that oftentimes these people carry themselves out in public in the way that they look at other people, the way they act about other people, the way that they walk. And it's shown by, just subhanAllah, the people that work out like to show people that how they like to work out. And all of a sudden, the short sleeve shirts that come out and letting those bulging muscles show. And again, that what is really happening here? That there's, these people are more susceptible that to this than others. And then finally, that you, what you could call power. And this relates to the people you know. And that this is also here, it's rampant in traditional Muslim countries as well. Who you know, and what is it you can do. And whether you are immune to some of the laws that other people are bound to. But it's also here in the United States and in other places. That the people that are with you, <coughs> how well connected you are, is that generally speaking, and sometimes... Uh, it's, it's teachers with other teachers in terms of numbers of students. And this again plays out in like things like Facebook likes, where people actually look like, how many Facebook likes is People actually do this. People, it's actually a criterion for some people going to conferences. They actually check the likes. I couldn't believe this when I heard this. But this is actually the, some people's criterion on who they invite to the conference. This is our state that we're in. We're going right down the lizard hole. Right down the same lizard hole. And sometimes it's in relation to that family. And this is kind of in a more traditional sense. Someone that has three or four sons. As opposed to someone that only has a couple children. This is less so I would say in the United States. But you see this traditionally. And in general, who you know. Right? And again, this is where, oh, do you not know who I am? Right? You're, you, do you not know who you're messing with? This is all kibber. It's very much this sense. And again, 
all of these seven causes, knowledge, action and worship, lineage and descent, beauty, wealth, strength, power, all of these things potentially that make the human being more susceptible to kibar and to have this trait of the heart strengthen. And the more that the trait of the heart strengthens is that the more manifestations that it has upon your tongue and upon your limbs. And he has another chapter that he mentions other uh, things that are more of an internal nature. And these are things like conceit, hatred, envy, and ostentation. And this is where it's a discussion of how all of the diseases of the heart are interrelated. And one provokes the other. So these are other things. We're going to skip over this uh, because I think there's, it, he treats it very briefly. And there's more important things that we have to get to. But the greater your conceit, the more likely you are to show kibar. Is that hiqid, having hatred in your heart towards someone, where you despise them, and there's ways that that happens. You became angry. You couldn't release your anger. So it relies dormant. And it develops into hatred. It's much easier to show kibber towards someone if that's in the heart than if it's not there. It agitates it and provokes it. Envy, same thing. If you're envious of someone, it again could provoke you to kibber. And likewise, if you're someone who um, really wants to have a high place in people's heart, Right. Ostentation is that that could also provoke it as well. Um, I think this is actually a good uh, stopping point. Um, if there's any quick questions, I think this last break will take a shorter break because we want to get in uh, a full session. What time is, is Asapra? No, what time is Asapra? Five. Five. Okay, good. So, um, is there any quick questions uh, on this material? Okay, so let's let's take a, a, a you have a question? Hold on. That's knowledge. So that that's yeah. Yeah, because that, that goes hand in hand with knowledge. Yeah. So the stronger the intellect, generally speaking, the more knowledge that I think it goes hand in hand with that. Yeah. And he includes it as a religious blessing, kind of in the context of um, the Muslim community, but I think you would extend it even beyond that, where in general, the more intelligent someone has, um, is that if someone's very smart, uh, I, you, if you're around highly intelligent people, oftentimes they get really frustrated with people that are not as smart as they are, and very easily will lash out at them when uh, they um, you know, you know, aren't, uh, aren't as quick and witty as they are. Any other quick questions? Mm -hmm. That's a very long discussion. Um, I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, um, I've thought a lot about how to frame um, Muslims' existence in non-Muslim majority co countries, especially oftentimes in situations where many people feel like they have their back up against the wall and they're constantly uh, that under the microscope and on the radar of other people. And um, I, I really believe is that what we need to encourage is principled engagement. I've heard other um, phrases used. Um, some of them I didn't feel uh, as comfortable with as this. And what is meant by principled is simply rooted in, uh, rooted in our iman, islam, and ihsan. Our belief, practice, and that uh, spirituality. In other words, is that our belief has to inform everything that is that we do. In belief, not just in terms of our creed, but extending from belief our perspective on life that comes from our belief. That's why there's a lot of details. What I mean by Islam practice is that 
primarily but not exclusively that the Sharia is that we are committed to law right yes we follow the laws of the land but we're committed to a sacred law and that there are certain things we can't do and if we're going to engage there will be limits but those limits are actually opportunities for creativity that they're not inhibitions. That's a whole other topic. I'll leave you to think about that. But there are limits. There are certain things we can't do. And then that the third dimension, which is Ihsan, this is where character comes in. This is where ethics, morality, sticking to our principles comes in. Good character, things of this nature. So when we talk about principle and engagement, that really it's a spectrum from grassroots work to political involvement. It could be someone starting their own business. It could be doing someone serving some type of humanitarian cause. It could be someone who works for someone else. It could be someone who's a school teacher. It could be someone who that it, you know, there's a whole broad spectrum of things. And whatever it is that we are doing, whether we are a doctor or a lawyer, the ones that are commonly mentioned, or whether we're an employee, or whether we open our own business, or whether they're a teacher, is that we approach our work with principles. And that we make our contributions in that realm, and in other aspects of our life, based upon our own principles. Okay, so it's very distasteful for me when I see people... Um, for instance, making economic suggestions with no knowledge of what Islam says about that. Now, to be fair, it's not readily available because some of these issues require a lot of thought and require committees of very intelligent people. So I'll make excuses for people. But what really is our solution? Right? We need to get more creative. It needs to be in line with our principles. We can't just parrot out things that we hear in the media and try to Islamicize them with fancy language. We have to create the right frame. Um, and this has to be done at all different levels, from the political all the way down to the grassroots and everything in between. When we talk about education, for like a totally practical example, right? do we have to buy into this whole theory of education that places overemphasis on a certain type of intelligence and that is all revolves around test scores. Is that the type of teacher that we should be? You could be a high school teacher in a public school, but be different. And your contribution in your school that you teach at is based upon your own principles, based upon your own theory of education that is defined by what we know about education from an Islamic perspective. You could sh actually care about the students. You could actually that inculcate wisdom into them in a very different way as opposed to just, you know, okay, check the boxes and get the day done. This is just a, a, a very small example. But there's a huge, there's a long list of things there uh, that, that, um, that, that could be discussed. But that's the gist of it. Yeah. And I think the big one there is to bridge that gap between our creed and our perspective. Because your perspective is, it's informed as well by the legal aspect and the ethical aspect, but most importantly uh, by um, uh, how, what it is that we believe. And that relates to things like what we believe about human beings, what we believe about the purpose of life, and then how we view things in creation. And the more and more that we get involved at the higher echelons of society, the more and more that we have to have detailed knowledge. And just the only exa the example that comes to the top of my mind is, do we believe, for instance, in a philosophy or a perspective of limited resources? Do we believe in limited resources that everyone is so worried about? Do we believe in population control? Do we believe that that we have to actually like, that, that cut back on the number of people in the world to live sustainably? Or is there a whole other way that we could approach that topic? There's a whole other way we could approach that topic, for sure. 
that doesn't negate the practical dimension, but it will be rooted in terms of how we view people, how we view family, how we view having children, and all those other type of things. And so th these are just small examples, and this is a huge, huge door. And my point is, is not to... Um, uh, I don't have all the answers. No one has all the answers. This is, you know, it's going to take 50 to 100 years to even start scratching the surface. This is, but we first have to be convinced this is the way we need to go. And, um, and, and then slowly move in the right direction. And as we progress as a community, you will find more and more specialization. The first few decades of this affair has been characterized by one-man armies doing a hundred jobs at once. And that's why we have to be very careful to criticize the people who came before us. Because they're doing the very best they can. And that they are forced to be in positions that require teams of specialists in any given area. And they're in like 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe up to a hundred different areas. So it's foolish to overly criticize them. And it's imprudent to think that we're not supposed to take it to the next level in the next generation. We have to make our contribution. And there's going to be more people that are doing that. And then the people that come after us are going to find many faults in the perspectives that we had, or limitations. And then they have to further the process. And this is the way that it works. This is, this is, this is how it works. But we should also, in general, the principle is that there's fadila and sabq. The people who came at the beginning, it's very hard to ever be like they were. The Sahaba, if you look at the detailed knowledge of the Tabi'een, there's no comparison. The Tabi'een had much more knowledge of the Sahaba, of the detailed knowledge. Not true knowledge, ilm al-khasha. There was no comparison between them and the Sahaba. But there was more detailed knowledge in the time of the, of, of the Tabi'een. But does that mean that they're more knowledgeable than the companions? If they wouldn't have done what they did, the Tabi'een wouldn't have been able to do what they did. And so forth and so on. I think we have to see um, that the spawning of Islam in these lands is the same. And we absolutely have to preserve a deep love and respect and loyal commitment to the people that opened up the doors for us. Otherwise, we've missed one of the most important parts of our deen. Um, and um, anyhow, should we take a little break? Hi, Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa ala. Um, I want to shift gears now because we've talked quite a bit about uh, Kibar and Ujab and look at in the beginning of this session what Hujjat al Islam Imam al Ghazali says about its cure, which is what we all want to be cured from this reprehensible vice and transition after that into very briefly looking at some of the character traits 
of the people of humility, which keep in mind is really the cure, is that we embody humility in all of our different states, and that is the cure in and of itself for this trait of kibber. So that he says here, and he introduces a chapter which is titled Bayan al Tariq fi Mu'alajat al Kibri, an exposition of the way to cure oneself from kibr, wiktisab al Tawaldir, and how to gain this trait of humility. And he starts by saying, Know that kibr is from the destructive vices. وَلَا يَخْرُوا أَحَدُوا مِنَ خَلْقَ عَنْ شَيْءٍ مِنْهُ Is that all people have traces of it. Okay, so it's going to it's going to be in almost all people. The key is to figure out what is the cause of that which exists within you so that you can overcome it. And all of those different reasons for which people have kibber or the causes or the provocations is that we need to sit down and think about our own selves. You might struggle with one or two of them, but you're alright with the others. We need to think about where we are in relation to those things. But he says, وَإِزَالَتُهُ فَرْدُ عَيْنِ But to cure yourself, to remove that which exists within you, is an individual obligation. And look what he says. These, are, these statements are so powerful. وَلَا يَزُولُ بِمُجَرَدَ التَّمَنِّي it is not going to be removed with wishful thinking. It's not just about, oh, that sounds great. I need to cure myself of it. Oh, I hope one day it goes. That's not how it works. Right? Just as that you could say, see someone very successful and be like, oh, I'm imagining myself as successful as they are. And you're going to wake up in the morning and expect your bank account to look like theirs. That's not how it works. It's not the tamanni. You have what is called tamanni and raja. Tamanni is like wishful thinking, and raja is true hope. And the difference between the two is that tamanni is what you would like to be like, but you don't act towards it. Raja hope is what you would like to be like, but you're actively trying. To get there. So there's a difference between the two. And so he says, Bel bil mu'alajati wusti'mal al adwiyat al qami'ati lah. How your situation is going to change if you that subjugate yourself to the treatment and you use the cures that are going to remove it. And then he says, is that وَفِي مُعَالَجَةِ مَقَامَيْنِ There are, if you will, two types of cures. There is the إِسْتِعْصَالْ أَصْلِهِ مِنْ سِنْخِهِ There is the complete removal of it from the heart, where kibber is uprooted from your heart. And so he says it's like pulling that tree out from its roots. And so all of the roots of kibber are gone from your heart. And he said, then the second degree is def al arid, is repelling the symptom minhu bil asbab al khasati of the various causes of it in relation to how we show pride towards other people. So, in other words, is that if you have this trait of kibber in the heart, it's going to lead to tekebber. We've talked about that multiple times now. And so, that when it, you have that thought or it comes to your heart to do that particular thing, is that even if it's still rooted in your heart, is that you can still refrain from doing that thing. But you, what you're doing is you're treating the symptom. You are not treating the underlying that cause. And so it's like anything else. It's like medicine that treats symptoms as opposed to that really that getting into the root cause where you have to make major lifestyle changes and change the way that you eat, change the way that you sleep, change the way that you take care of yourself and so forth and so on if you're really going to be cured. 
So the same thing applies uh, in relation to the spiritual heart. And he says, as for completely uprooting this trait of kibber, he says its treatment, as it's always going to be with all of the other diseases of the heart, is with ilm and with amal, with knowledge and action. And one is not sufficient. You have to combine both. And he begins, and he goes into great detail about the knowledge component. And essentially, it relates to knowledge of your own self in going through a long, a long, a prolonged reflection exercise and how you relate to your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in general, to the extent that we know the greatness of Allah until we know the lowliness of our own selves is that we're never going to do what is needed in relation to the knowledge portion. So it's summed up in that. And so what Imam al-Ghazali does is he actually gives us an aid to reflect on this. So if you purchase the book, which I highly recommend, you can look in this section. And this is something that you might want to read for the next month. Read it every night. Over and over again. Over and over again. Over and over again. This is what these books require. Again, this is just the first step of starting the process while we're in this particular hall. The real work begins at home. And it's no different than that getting a diet prescribed to you by a dietitian. The real work begins when you actually put that into practice. And so we can't have tamanni. We don't want just tamanni. Anyhow, that he goes into great detail reminding us of our origins. Which it's summarized in that statement that we mentioned earlier. We know how we began. We know how we're going to end. And we know what our state is right now. This should be enough. How could we be arrogant when we know the true reality of our state? And all of these things that we see cause people arrogance, they go. They're ephemeral. They're here for a period of time and they go. Physical beauty, how long does that last? Wealth, how long does that last? Lineage, how long does that last? All of these other things, how long do they last? They go. And when you go to the grave, you take none of that with you. This is obvious. We all know that. So the knowledge portion is not some that you know unknown knowledge that you've never heard of. It's just the process of reflecting upon it. Where it's going to have its impact in terms of uprooting this trait from the heart. He said, and then, in relation to the practical aspect of the treatment, and this is all about uprooting this trait, it's found in true humility and consistently putting into practice the traits of the, the, of the humble, which we're going to come back to and we'll mention some of them. So everything that we're going to come back to, you put those into practice day in and day out, day in and day out, day in and day out. And so when you do that, eventually you will reach a place where it's been uprooted from your heart. It no longer has a grip on you. And then no matter what it is that you have or don't have, you will not be susceptible to this disease anymore. That even if you didn't have wealth and you get wealth, or you didn't have one of those things and you get it, you'll be protected because it's gone from your heart. It's been uprooted, which is the goal. Now, generally speaking, that takes a long time. So again, when we talk about this, we have to recognize this is why this science is really about our approach to the religion. It's not something that you just kind of check in and then check out. It's your approach to the religion. Every prayer that you pray with concentration, every dhikr that you make with concentration, everything that you do religiously is helping you in general towards the state. Everything that you do. If you do it with right, in, right intentions and that you have concentration while you're doing it, it will all 
that all of these things collectively will help you in this regard. Purify your heart and to return to Allah Ta'ala with a sound heart. So it's to persist in that the traits of the, the, of the humble. And then what he does after this is he goes through each one of these traits. Where that he reminds us of lineage. And if there's anything that someone is caught up on in relation to that lineage, he treats it. So that when in that moment that we are potentially looking down upon someone because of their descent, is that we can stop ourselves. And he does the same thing in relation to physical beauty. He does the same thing in relation to all of these other traits. And this is not really the place to go into this detail. This requires time. And if we were teaching this in a weekly class, that we might do one or two of these every single week. And to go through it actually very slowly. And that these books are not the type of books that you write a syllabus for or even cover in like ten lectures. Although sometimes you have to do that. Generally speaking, these are books is that you take a little bit every day of your life. Because they're books of implementation. implementation. Uh, they're not books of just, re just reading and then putting them down at that point. So I, I don't want to go into too many of those details. But one very helpful thing that he does include here. And um, after that the individual cures to each individual cause is that he gives us five ways of testing ourself to see if this trait has, of kibbutz has been uprooted from our hearts or not. And that the first is, and this tends to be for the scholar or the academic or someone who has something to do with knowledge. And what he says is, is that put yourself in a position and I'm using a bit of poetic license here, where you're arguing with someone about some point of knowledge. You have a perspective, and they have a perspective. And Allah brings about the truth, and you realize it, on the tongue of that other person. And you realize it. Is it easy for you to accept, or not? Or is it difficult? So sometimes this happens even in, you know, very minor things with your spouse. Where you realize, oh wait, they're actually right. Do we have the humility to be like, oh yeah, you're right. Or do we keep arguing our point knowing that they're actually right. Because we're stubborn. And we don't want to admit that they, we were wrong and they were right. So this could also be that with a colleague, and this is especially with people like we're debating. There's not too many debates anymore, but oftentimes that you will see people that arguing over something which is really not even that big of a deal, but people are going back and forth, and they just stubbornly refuse to accept what the other person is saying. So if indeed that it comes, tr comes to the surface that actually what they said is the truth, and you find it difficult for you to accept, it's heavy on you, and you don't want to that submit to that, is that this is a sign that there is remnants of kibber in the heart. He said the second thing is, is that you imagine that you are gathering together with people that are like you in a public place. And that you imagine that the people that are at your same rank are given preference over you. They're brought to the front, you're not brought to the front. They're treated nicer, you're not treated like that. They're welcome more, you're not welcomed as much. Is, it, is that heavy on your heart? In reality, why do we care about these things? Now, I'm not talking about where, I'm not saying these things are right. But in general, there is potentially a way of being that no matter who treats you in what, which way, you always do the right thing. And I'm not talking about solving these problems society. So we're speaking of something very specific here. And these are people that are 
roughly the same. And some people get preferential treatment and others don't. How do we respond to that? And if that's heavy on us, okay, uh, then that could be a sign that there's traces of kippah in our hearts. And Shepan might find other ways for us to try to bring up other reasons potentially that that happened. And some of those reasons could be valid. And maybe they were the case. Maybe there's reasons why those other people gave that preferential treatment. And that's not really what we're talking about right here. Because it could be wrong and it could need to be treated. But we're talking about the individual right now. In terms of how they respond to that. Why did they feel that they deserve that preferential treatment in the beginning? More so than others. Or at least at the same level. It's signs of the trait of a trace of kibbutz. He said the third test is to imagine yourself being invited to the house of a simple person, or literally a poor person. Someone who does not live in that gated community. Someone who is not going to serve you a nice, <laughs> delicious meal. Someone whose house is not comfortable to be in. But how do we respond? Is that naturally that we like being in places that are very nice and we like don't like being in places that are very simple how do we respond if that it's heavy upon us responding to the invitation of the poor person it's a sign that there's traces of kibber in the heart and these tests, you don't actually have to be in that position to test yourself with them. You can actually imagine yourself. You can actually literally sit down and imagine yourself having these things happen. Imagine yourself going in, in that, how, what would your response be? Imagine the house that you would be going to. Is that, is, what, what's your heart like? And this is where we start to preempt the diseases of the heart. And the more that we do this, is that the more we'll uproot all the diseases. Right? So, for instance, in terms of, of envy, is that there's people naturally that you tend to like more than others. So you imagine like your arch enemy, if you have one, a person you don't really care for too much, attains just what you really want to attain, whatever that thing is, a particular job, whatever else it is. You imagine that person that you don't care for too much attaining it. And is that hard on you? You feel like a fire-like feeling inside. Is it heavy? Or is it no big deal? Then what you do is you keep imagining that. And you actually make dua for people to attain those things. And if you preempt this, preempt this enough, your natural state will be as it's supposed to be, is that any blessing that you hear about, anyone attaining, the first reaction is happiness. Right? That should be our only reaction. Anything else is a disease. Right? Not only should you be, you should be any blessing that any Muslim receives. And a blessing is anything that's pleasant to the human being. Even if it's worldly. You hear about something, you should be happy. That is the natural state to be in. As opposed to, like just <clears throat> not wanting that to happen. you got to work on yourself. But the point is, if you do that enough in the khalwa, your first reaction is going to be a genuine smile and happiness. But again, it takes work. And the same thing with kibar. And that he says, is that, the next way to test yourself, and this is probably more so in the pre-modern world, maybe less so in our time, because there tends to be uh, more equal roles in this. He says, is that you imagine yourself that going to the marketplace yourself, buying food for your family, and buying food for your friends, in the marketplace and taking it back, right? as if you're the one who's a servant in the help of other people. Is that, is that something that bothers you? 
Do you see yourself as too high to do these types of things? Do you see, and you could extend this also by that doing work around the house. Do you see yourself as above any work around the house? If you work for an organization, do you see yourself as above any type of work in that organization? And in turn, in organizations, this happens all the time. People see themselves like, no, I, I'm not going to do that. Right? I'm so much more qualified than that. But if anyone thinks that they are above cleaning bathrooms, there's traces of kipper still in the heart. If there really is an organization that is doing something good for the ummah, it's serving a good cause, we should see ourselves not even deserving to clean bathrooms. That's the natural state to be in, of a truly religious state, where you actually genuine, genuinely feel honored <coughs> to clean a bathroom. I know that sounds strange, but it's very real. And imagine if the people that were working with you, that's how they thought. That's how they thought. And one of the things that our teacher used to do regularly was he would move people around in the organization all of the time. Someone would move from where they're like the executive director, and he would move them way down, if you will, in the hierarchy. But they didn't see it as down. And he would move someone here to here, someone here to here, someone here to here. Obviously within areas that they still had skills and had competency in. But he would move people around all of the time. So that no one felt like, this is my area and I'm not going to do anything else. All the time. And if people were bothered by that, because the whole purpose of this, this is a type of suruk, it's a type of spiritual wayfaring. But the problem lies if you don't see this as part of the spiritual path. There has to be the broader frame on why you're serving to begin with. And you come, even if you're highly qualified, is that you should be willing to have a quote-unquote inferior role. But the whole point, there isn't that superior and inferior roles. They're just different roles. Everyone is a piece in the puzzle. And sometimes for people that they're very well trained in certain areas, it's hard for them to fit in, a, in an, a, a role that they might think is inferior. And again, this should be if we think that cleaning bathrooms is above us. Right? No, we have, we have to work on our heart. We don't deserve anything. We are in need of the service. The service is not in need of us. We are in need of the deen. The deen is not in need of us. Allah will bring other people. If it's not us, we'll go. And Allah will bring other people. It is an honor for us to serve in any capacity. Unconditionally. Whatever that is. It is our honor to serve. And we realize is that we are in absolute need of the service. And this is why you see here these great examples of people who actually used to do that. They actually liked to do this is to clean bathrooms because it's humbling and there's stories of the famous Sheikh Sha'rawi where one time his son found him cleaning the public bathrooms on the streets of Egypt he was taking a little bit long in the bathroom and his son was worried about him and he went in and he found his father cleaning the bathrooms public bathrooms and he said that he was doing this to suppress something that he felt came into his heart and there's minor ways that we could do this all the time. That we could clean that the bathroom in our own house without anyone knowing. No one knows. We clean it subtly. And we do it to break ourselves. And we make the intention that we're serving our family. Even if they're messing things up. That we clean it. Not get out of the bathroom. Why did you? Didn't you? How many times did I do it? Right. You clean it. It's a great spiritual exercise. If, in general, the secret to marriage, the secret to marriage, is approaching it as a way of traveling the spiritual path. That is the secret of marriage. That Allah Ta'ala, in, unless that, it reaches the point where there's abuse. That's where we draw the line, and that needs to be dealt with. You never have to succumb to abuse of any type. Whether it's physical, verbal, emotional, or anything else. So, putting that aside, 
if it crosses a red line, it crosses a red line. Inside of that red line is that if both parties approach the relationship as a means of self-transformation, as a means of attaining and achieving the highest degrees of the spiritual path, you'll have a great marriage. It's not necessarily going to be easy. It's not supposed to be easy. It is not supposed to be easy. Because there's things that you will learn that you can only learn in that situation. And if you approach it like that, and that's your standard, when things get difficult, you'll have something to come back to. And you'll remind you, and no matter how many times you fall short, you remain introspective, and you go back to square one, and you try to do better. If you can commit it to that, there's nothing that you can't overcome. So this is the next test. And then... The fifth is, and this might not be the best thing to do, um, he says, is for you to dress in a way that you wouldn't normally dress. And he literally says for you to wear shabby clothing out in public. And if that you, it's hard for you to dress other than the way that you normally dress, and you don't want to go into public like that, it's a sign that there's remnants of kibber. That one we might want to be a little bit careful with. Um, but some of these treatments are, are there, that things you wouldn't normally do to balance the scale. And um, again, these are ways that, that we can that come to this conclusion whether or not it is, uh, there's remnants of this left in the heart or not. I want to go back now to uh, humility in this, in, the, in this remaining uh, few minutes. Uh, because it's really, as Imam Ghazali said, that the stronger that our knowledge becomes about who we are and who Allah is, and then the more that we take on the traits of the humble, the more that this trait will be completely uprooted from our hearts. And there are a number of statements of our Prophet وسلم, that indicate to us that the importance of humility that many of them we've heard before. And one of them is, is that Allah Ta'ala says, or our Prophet says, مَا زَادَ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا بِعَفْوًا إِلَّا عِزَّةً As that Allah will only increase a servant who pardons others in honor. Sometimes we think, if I keep, up, if I keep accepting his apology, or her apology, they're going to keep getting over on me. And, in extreme situations, that might be true. But in most situations, it's not true. And then, وَمَا تَوَاضَ أَحَدٌ لِلَّهِ إِلَّا رَفَعُهُ اللَّهِ That no one will humble themselves before Allah except that Allah will raise them. So if you think that by being humble, that somehow you are positioning yourself to that not achieve certain things or receive certain things, is that what our Prophet is teaching us is that this is a misconception is that humility only brings about what is good. And this is not a quality that is that high on the list of the desired commodities in the modern world. Uh, most people will see humility as weakness. And partially that stems from their misconception of what true humility really is. True humility is a trait of heart. And again, it doesn't that negate the idea of carrying ourselves with sakina and waqar, with tranquility and dignity outside. You could be a person that is that very influential, but is the most humble of people. The primary way that we're humble is that a humility that at the heart level, and this is why it's only till you move to the higher degrees of ma'rifa and knowledge of Allah, is that will you truly that be humble in the true meaning of the word. Okay, so um, there's some very beneficial um, uh, athar. Sayyidah Aisha said, is that indeed that you are heedless of the very best form of worship, which is humility. She considered it afdal al-ibadah, the best of worship, which is humility. And there are ways of worshiping Allah. Worship is not just standing in prayer is that constantly being in a state of humility is worship, consistently. It's worship of Allah. 
every trait that you're supposed to have at the heart level is worship of Allah Ta'ala. That Fudayl ibn Iyad was asked about what humility is. He says, it's for you to accept the truth. Even if you hear it from a child, that you accept it from them. Even if you hear it from the most ignorant of people. So even the people that you think that you're above, you're willing to accept truth from them. And Qatada said, anyone who's given wealth or physical beauty or clothes or knowledge, and then they're not humble in relation to those gifts, it will be against them on the Day of Judgment. So these are all tests. All those seven things we mentioned and the, some of the others that are mentioned here that relate to them, they're tests. And so we absolutely have to remain humble in relation to those things. And then that one of them said, is that after asked about what humility is, he said, it's to leave your home and not to meet a single person except that you see them as better than your own self. And Imam Ghazali gives us practical ways in other books on how to do this. And that to protect yourself from kibr. If you see an older person, you think that they've been Muslim much longer than I have. If you see a younger person, you think that, oh, they don't have as much sins as I have. If you see a knowledge, more knowledgeable person, they have more knowledge than me. If you see a less knowledgeable person, is that I might know more than them, but I've gotten myself in more trouble because I sin knowingly, and so forth and so on. There's not a single person that you can think of except that you find a way to convince yourself that they're better than you are. And then eventually is that you won't have to have this internal conversation. It will be intuitive to you. Alright, let's just um, quickly go through. He mentions a whole bunch. I'll just highlight a few. This is his whole chapter on the exposition of the traits of the humble. And that these are the various ways of being. He said that it's a sign of humility to not want people to stand for you. He says it's a sign of humility to not want people to walk behind you, rather to walk beside you. He says it is a sign of humility to that willingly go visit other people as opposed to saying, no, they have to come visit me. He says it is a that sign of humility to that sit with all different types of people and to feel comfortable despite that person's social standing who is sitting next to you. And he says it's a sign of the humility to feel comfortable sitting with people of all different types of illnesses and disabilities. Which is amazing. Is that there are some people who just don't want to be around people like that. And it's from humility to feel very comfortable sitting behind people that have some type of medical complications or that disabilities of the sort. And he says it's a sign of humility to feel very comfortable doing household duties and not seeing yourself above them. And he says it's a sign of humility as well to happily by the needs that, of your household needs and to bring them home. And he says it's a sign of humility to wear simple clothing even when you have the ability to wear that more expensive clothing. And it's a sign of humility is that when you are criticized that you're able to remain that humble and you, when you're criticized is that you don't become angry. You're going to become angry. But you could probably say you can control your anger. If you just lash out and just rah, right? It's a sign we need to work on our humility. And again, it doesn't mean that we humiliate ourselves. But part of Sakina and Wakar is, is that when people criticize you, is that you have a measured response. And you respond in the very best of ways. And then, فَمَجَامِرْ حُسْنِ الْأَخْرَاقِ وَالتَّعْوَاضِعْ سِيرُتُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَعَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمِ We could have just started by this. It would have been a lot easier. As he says, is that all good character traits and all manifestations of humility 
are found in the life of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, this is what whom we need to follow and this is what it is that we need to learn. In other words, is that if you read the life of the Prophet Sallallahu and this is what we should be doing, we should be spending time reflecting upon the Prophet's life. He is the greatest sign of Allah Ta'ala of all. We should read his great character traits. We should have a weird, in fact, a litany, a regular litany of reading the Shama'il, the great traits of character of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all traits of character, not just humility, that will you will be adorned with them that if we do this, and this is why it's so important that we connect to our Prophet Wasallam, and that the greater the attachment of the heart is that the more channels because the attachment acts like a conduit of good that comes to you from the messenger. The more love and attachment and a connection, the more of who he is وسلم, and all of the traits that he has, the more that it comes to you and uh, this is why that we have to begin this discussion and end this discussion with the that great traits of our Prophet وسلم, that we didn't really get into Uja, but as we began is that the cure for many of the causes of Ujib are the same just as many of the cures for Ujib are the same uh, as they are for Kibar and so we will leave that to you to read about that in more detail hopefully you have enough keys at this point to uh, read through this very good translation of Dr. Ruslam and that's so that we can continue the study of this and to take this very seriously and again these are books of practice these are books of, of action that we need to that strive day in and day out to make them that a reality within us and that inshallah Allah wa ta'ala will bless us and to open up the doors of all good and shall we never shall forget inshallah the whole purpose of why we do this this is to polish our heart. Imam Ghazali says is that every good character trait that you that adorn yourself with, it is a door that opens up between you and Allah. Every vice that is lodged in your heart is a veil between you and Allah. And ultimately between the highest degree of connection to the Prophet Sallallahu and the lowest degree, there are one hundred and forty seven thousand veils. And what we want to do is, is to start chipping away those veils. Day after day, gathering after gathering, prayer after prayer, dhikr after dhikr. Everything that we want to do, chip away, chip away, chip away. And remove those veils that ultimately leads into the highest degree of connection to the Rasul, in which there is spiritual realization, in which there is that a living of this deen as it was meant to live, and in it as well is the Sa'adat al darain felicity in this world and the next. May Allah wa ta'ala uh, give us tawfiq and bless us in all of our affairs. Um, I think we have just a few minutes if there's any quick questions. Um, I apologize for not leaving more time, but we had a lot of material to get through. I hope this has been at least a little bit helpful. Uh, if there's any quick questions before we stand up to pray, Asr, Ahana wa sahla. Mm, that is an excellent question. So, did everyone hear the question, her, the sister's question over here? Uh, okay. So, is it um, possible to truly be humble, by and 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 to also, um, um, and and to simultaneously be um, the the way that I understand the question is, is that almost where you're like insecure about yourself and that focus too much upon your faults, um, and. There's two things here always when we deal with questions like this. One is having first the correct conception and secondly doing what it is that we're supposed to do. So I would answer your question by saying if we have the correct conception I would say yes. I'd say no it is not impossible and it is absolutely possible to join both at the same time. Okay. And because is that um, far from having our own human frailty and our faults lead to a heightened degree of insecurity where we, in a sense, the way that it's used in the modern world, lose our confidence and it affects our social interactions, is that this stems from 
that not having the correct conception. And we have to embrace our human frailty. We have to embrace our faults and our mistakes. And what I mean by embrace is recognize is that we are a human being and it's expected that we're going to have faults. Figure out which ones that we do have and learn to work with them. Much of the problem lies in how we relate our faults to other people's perception. And if we can get intellectual clarity on that, that in terms of that this is who I am, I know what I'm dealing with. And if we, we need to divorce from the get-go in terms of our conception, is that that weird feeling in our heart that where we're always desiring to be validated by other people and worry about what it is that they think of us. This complicates things. So if we have that correct conception, yes. In, in fact, then being acutely aware of your faults will help you actually be humble. Because you realize, is it how short did you tend to fall? Now, there's a big difference between recognizing your faults and between falling into despair as a result of your faults. Again, this gets back to conception. And that this is where you realize is that Allah Ta'ala has created every human being and every human being has faults. This is part of the wisdom in how He created His creation, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you come to understand His mercy and His clemency, and you understand the whole purpose of the religious life, is that you won't panic as you start to come to terms with your own human frailty and all of your faults. And again, that you will understand is that how you're going to be judged is not other people's perception of you. It's how that you succeed in relation to the test that Allah Ta'ala has given you, who knows that perfectly everything that is that you're going through. And so a lot of this is complicated again by that us being worried about what people think about us. And we have to be very clear at that level uh, and that this is in general, and then there are certain conditions where it requires certain techniques where you walk people through certain things because there's so much damage from a situation that they've been in. And um, that's a different story, and um, sometimes it requires even professional help in certain cases. But these are the general principles uh, and, how we, and how we view this. Is that kind of what you're asking, or not, not, not 100%? Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, the name of the translation? Yeah, so it's it's just the, the, the it's it's a purple book. It's published by the Islamic Text Society and, and it just says on Al Ghazali on condemnation of pride and self admiration. It's translated by Muhammad Rustum. Rustum. R U S T O M. Yeah. Mm hmm. I guess you could say certain things are a result of practice, so you have like, like yapni or tawakkul. Um, are these, like, how do we separate out, what do we, because I've heard you can practice humility too. Um, are these, how, how do we separate out like what you actually do and what's the result of practice of doing something? And it's very complex. I mean, it's, it's so you guys have great questions. I wish we had more time. This is, we really should be leaving, leaving like two hours of discussion, because discussion where this all really comes out. It's a great question. Right? Because every trait that you have, there'll be ways that you practice that trait. I.e., there'll be ways that if you have that trait, you'll reinforce it. Or if you're still working to acquire it, by doing it, it will help establish it. Okay, so let's just say, you mentioned humility, let's just say generosity. So every time that you are generous, it reinforces that trait of generosity. Let's say you're not a generous person, but you know you need to be. By doing an act of generosity, even starting with something small and then doing something larger and larger, it helps you establish that trait in you. So it's the same thing with humility, all of these different traits. Mercy is that, in fact, that is the way that you go about achieving this good character. Is that one by one, you go through these traits 
and it might not happen in a linear way. You might do different things at different times, or you might focus on one trait at a certain time. That would be great if someone said, hey, look, this next month, I'm going to focus on mercy. This next month, I'm going to focus on this. This next month, I'm going to focus on this. That's a great way of doing it. And this is where you get into this other dimension of the spiritual path where you have teachers who help you do that and sometimes give you specific lessons to focus on at specific times. Or you could do this yourself. Um, the door is open to do this. And as long as you're doing it in a balanced way. So, um, yes. Yeah. Any more quick questions? Chayo? I think that was in the lunch conversation, but um, yeah, I mean, our entire dean is based on submission. That's what we tend to forget. Everything. All Iman, Islam, and Ihsan is based upon submission. The fact that it is rational just means that Allah Ta'ala has given us a deen, a fitra. And part of the fitra is proper thinking, rational thinking. So our deen is a rational deen in that we can understand it. It's intelligible. That our creed makes sense. Our law, if you understand what underlies it, it makes sense. Our ethical that uh, theory makes sense. Um, but the, so the, the whole point here is, is that it's all ultimately based upon submission. And that every manifestation of Iman and Islam and Ihsan is essentially a manifestation of your submission to Allah. You submit at the level of belief. You submit at the level of practice. You submit at the level of character. It's all ultimately about submission. And why submission? Again, you want to talk about an unpopular word in the modern world. I mean, that's one of them. And we have a lot of very unpopular words in our deen. Uh, very popular words in our deen that are very unpopular. But this is, this. yes, of course. Again, the modern world is not our starting point for success. That it's all about submission. Why? Because we're servants of Allah. Our reality is that we're passive. Every single human being is passive before Allah. And the more we submit, the more we will see the divine mercy. The whole essence of our deen, it's all about submission from beginning to the end. And why? Because the whole goal of the religion is to de-emphasize the self and emphasize Allah. So in the end, all that remains, we tend to forget. What is the highest station? Fana. Annihilation. You've forgotten yourself. You've forgotten you exist. And you're just perpetually in the state of remembrance of Allah. And then the only station that higher is higher than Fana. It's Fana al Fana. That's stuff Allah for speaking about these things. I'm going to get myself in trouble from our teachers. But I'm speaking strictly from an a intellectual perspective is that it's where you are annihilated in your annihilation. And then you have a station of baqa, where now it's subsistence. Now you can be with people, but you're completely, you're not there with the people. You're just there to help people. And the point of it is, is that submission is unpopular in people's minds, but it's, it's our whole deen is based upon submission. And in order for you to really that realize the religion, you have to realize the highest degree of submission in all of its aspects. Because that the greatest pleasure of all is the pleasure of the remembrance of Allah and knowing Him. And the greatest pleasure in paradise of all is gazing upon His noble countenance. And all of these things, the whole point is, where's the self? It's gone. It has to go. Yourself is by consensus of the scholars of the inner science, the greatest veil between you and Allah. So just think about the challenge of our time that is literally just like blowing, like just blowing powerfully into ourself. 
there was one, we didn't mention it, but there was a man who came to Sayyidina Omar and he asked Sayyidina Omar's permission to teach publicly. And Sayyidina Omar, who was very wise, he saw that this individual had an ego problem. And he said, is that, no, I'm not going to allow you to do that. I'm afraid, is that, is that, you know, you're going to be blown up such that you reach the stars. And people's egos, if you look at it, is that people have inflated egos. And some of them are really, really, really big. And there's degrees of it. And the greater the ego, degree of the ego, the more veiled you'll be from Allah. Period. And um, we all know this. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. We all know this. Um, it's just a matter of committing collectively to build the environments that we need to help each other. Where's Ammo, Khari Ammo, when you need them? So Atif has to, we all have to pray also. So Atif has to make the dua then. Hmm? Naib and al Walid. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. We ask our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala to direct our hearts to Him. May Allah tabarak wa ta'ala cure us completely and comprehensively until that nothing remains in our heart except pure submission to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and pure desire to draw near to Him. May Allah ta'ala fill our hearts with all good, to fill our hearts with light, to fill our hearts with blessing. And bless us to be people who dedicate ourselves to Him night and day. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma bless us with complete following of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Take care of all of our needs inwardly and outwardly and grant us relief and relief to the ummah of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May we all have long productive lives and obedience, Ya Rabbi Al-Adameen, and to give us knowledge of this deen, true fiqh in this deen, Ya Rabbi Al-Adameen, and to give us openings like you give the elect of the odi and the Sadiheen. May Allah Tabarak wa ta'ala bless this time that we spent together, allow it to be of long-lasting benefit, whereby which is that as we transition from this world into the next, that it is meaningful and that it is a means for the greatest good. May Allah Ta'ala make us firm upon this path and may we have the last thing that we say when we exit this dunya, be la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, completely actualizing its meanings inwardly and Outwardly, wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam bi sirra sallallahu ala al-Fatiha ila hadratin nabi.